Okay, so hello everybody, good afternoon. This is the last day of the summer school. Uh, and this is going to be the, the, the last talk. We are going to have a closing session uh, in the end. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, just a quick reminder, uh, you received um, a feedback form. Uh, you know, please take some time to fill it in. It's, it's going to be really helpful for us to keep improving the school. Um, so we are looking forward to, to have those results. You know, we are planning to present the results of this uh, feedback uh, in the closing session. Um, and, and now I have the great pleasure of uh, having with us Adele Ribeiro. Adele is a postdoctoral research scientist in the Causal AI Laboratory. Uh, she works with Professor Elias Berenboim. Um, she is currently interested in the emergent field of causal health sciences. Adele received her PhD and master's degrees in computer science from the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, and she's going to present a tutorial on causal data science that was prepared together with Professor Elise Barimboy, uh, who is an associate professor at Columbia University and leads the Causal AI Lab. Okay, without further ado, uh, thank you very much, Adele. You can start when we are ready. Right, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I will start my, I will try to share my screen. Um, okay, can you see my screen? Yes. All right, uh, thank you. So uh, thank you everyone for being here. Also, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here in the Lisbon Machine Learning School. Uh, I'll be speaking about causal data science. Uh, I, I believe, uh, so as, as in the introduction, they, they, they already said, I, I'm, I'm Adair Ribeiro. I'm a postdoc in the causal AI lab, uh, where I'm working with Professor Elias Brian Boyne. So this is our website, uh, causalai.net. So if you are interested in causality, you can check our papers. We have also a lot of resources there. So uh, I re re really recommend you to go there. And today I'm going to, do, to, to give a brief introduction to um, just, sorry. So I, today I would like to, I would like to give a, a, a brief introduction to causal inference in, the, in data fusion. And what I mean by that is to how can we combine uh, multiple and heterogeneous data sets? So coming from uh, observational and uh, experimental studies, how can we combine and leverage these data sets to extract causal knowledge in a principal way? Um, so uh, to understand the aspirations and challenges in modern data science, I would like to start with a few quotes. So uh, for this first one is, is, is from Hal Varins, the chief economist at Google and professor of information sciences, business and economics in UC Berkeley. And he says, the ability to take data, to be able to understand it, to extract value from it, to visualize it, to communicate it, that's going to be hugely important in the next decades. Uh, this is another quote by Gary King. It's a political scientist, uh, also professor in Harvard University. Uh, for him, big data or data science is not about data. It's something else. And Yudar Pro, uh, he's the father of the modern causal inference theory. He's also a professor of computer science and statistics in UCLA. And he combines this, uh, these two other views of data science by saying that Data science is only as much of a science as it facilitates the interpretation of data. It's a two-body problem connecting data to reality. So in the first quote here, we, we see that data is the central piece of data science, is the key of everything. For Gary King, it's the opposite. Data, uh, it's not about data, it's, it's something else. Maybe he's referring here to the reality uh, where the data is coming from. So the, from the context that the data has been collected. And Pro has this, uh, this view that combines both, that data, is, it is important, but we need, we need tools, we need a language. So this whole theory to connect the data to the reality where the data is coming from. So we need to understand the data generating mechanisms to actually do data science in a scientific way. Um, so what's the current state of the modern data science and causal inference? So as so here I report from the trends as a soldier in the in the field of causal inference. What can I say about the current state of the field? 
Uh, we can say a lot about uh, what's going on by looking at the news. So I have here a piece of news from the CNN Health, where the, the headline says, heavy coffee drinking in people under 55 is linked, is linked to early death. So clearly they are suggesting here that by, by, by having a lot of coffee, uh, maybe you die earlier than expected. But they are kind of shy here. They are using this word linked because they maybe they are trying to be protected here. Maybe they are just using associations to infer causation. So it, it's, it's unclear uh, the, the meaning of the message here. And, and this is another news where they are showing the relationship of coffee consumption and mortality. And if you look at the paper a little bit, if you read a little bit more about the paper, they, they show you that there are also beneficial health effects of, of, uh, about the coffee consu consumption. So it's a, a different result. So before they are saying that it's linked, linked, linked to uh, early death, and now they are saying that there are beneficial effects. So what's going on here? Why did the results are changing? Uh, this is about alcohol. So alcohol causes 20,000 cancer deaths in the US annually. It seems concerning. But then we have another news saying that this is not so bad. Like one drink of red, red wine or alcohol, it's relaxing to circle, uh, circulation, but two drinks are stressful. So there's a threshold here. And then we have this other news saying that why do heavy, drinking, heavy drinkers outlive no, outlive no drinkers? So it seems that now it's a good idea to have a lot of uh, alcohol. So what's happening? And I, I just want to show uh, this last piece, piece of news here from the New England Journal of Medicine. It's a top venue in, in medicine where they are also using associations here, association of nut consumption with total and causal specific mortality. So it's kind of a joke. They are using some kind of associations to say about causation and uh, it's nuts. <laughs> uh, so what's going on here? Why these inferences are so fragile? Why uh, the conclusions are changing every couple of years? And um, Uh, I'm reading the, the, the question here. Yeah, going to the doctor causes that. <laughs> Maybe it's true. <laughs> um, so, but what's going on here? That is, our view is that there is a causal, a lack of causal inference and data fusion capabilities. And uh, now that I know that uh, most of uh, uh, the audience here has this huge interest in, in natural language processing. I also want to bring this challenge to you um, with this question. How, how to extract the causal knowledge from textual data collections? So we have a lot of data available. We have this large amount of uh, data coming from, for example, PubMed corpus, or um, with a lot, of, a lot of annotated abstracts, full articles. So how can we use this data and then we add this layer, this causal layer in the NLP AI tools to have <clears throat> to extract more generalizable knowledge and to make more robust decisions. Uh, so <clears throat> this is the goal also of our team. In our lab, our goal is to develop machinery, and this includes develop a language, some criteria and algorithms to cohesively, co cohesively combining multiple and heter heterogeneous data sets. This includes textual uh, data, data sets as well. And, and then how can you, we use this data uh, to infer effects of intervention, so causal effects, and also to make more robust productions, predictions. Uh, if uh, there, there's this paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, by Elias Barimboy and, and Yudea Pro. And we have here mo uh, most of the, it's like exposition about most of the uh, advances in the field and also the challenge and open problems. So if you are interested in this field, I really recommend you to check this paper out. Um, also, we are interested 
in the implementation of the methods just to facilitate the use of the tools. So we have this web application that I, I will try to show a little bit uh, during this, this tutorial. Uh, if you are interested and if you like it, uh, please uh, sign up. It's causalfusion.net. Uh, please sign up with your educational email because it's, it's still in beta. In, in beta. It's, it's not available for everyone. We have around, uh, uh, I, I believe, 1,500 50, people, but it is, it is still in, in, beta, in, in beta. So if you are interested, please sign up with your educational uh, email or send me an email uh, to, to, to allow you to use the, the app. So we are talking here about data, 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 but that is a challenge. And it's a huge challenge because all data is not created equal. The key observation that we, we can make here is that there is a lot of data out there, but the data is almost invariably collected under different experimental conditions. Also, the underlying populations are different. Uh, the sampling procedure not always is, uh, is randomized. The treatment assignment also is not, sometimes, sometimes is not randomized. And uh, the variables that are, that are measured across these studies, studies not always are the same. The set of variables are not the same across these studies. So the columns of the data set are different. Uh, in words, the collected data, the data that we have available, available is completely messy and rarely met, uh, perfectly matched with the inferential target. So this seems a, a, a really, uh, this really, uh, it, it seems tough. Like, how can we use this data? Because usually we have this impression that the data has to be perfectly collected. Like we have, we need a, a very good protocol. And, but the data that we have available is messy. How can we, uh, we deal with that? Um, but that is positive. Uh, there's a positive side here. Uh, and the positives is that the, these dimensions are now formalized. So we understand right now um, what are these uh, this, this dimensions that we call, call uh, we call causal data fusion dimensions. So we, we understand what, what are the implications of uh, differences in, in all these dimensions that I just listed here. And also we, we've been uh, developing conditions and algorithms to decide what's entailed from a certain data collection. This is what we call causal data fusion. How can we combine? Uh, by accounting for differences in all these dimensions. So just to ground a little bit more, um, so we, we usually have a, a target. So this is our inferential target. And the target here is the causal effect. The causal effect comes from the interventional distribution. So it, it is a probability distribution under the intervention on the variable X. The intervention is denoted by the operator do. So it, it's, uh, it's denoting as if we had randomized the assignment of this, verb, uh, of this variable X. So we want to estimate the, the intervention of distribution as if we had performed or conducted an experiment by uh, where we randomized the variable X. Note that this is different from the conditional distribution uh, from observational studies where we can, so in, in, the, in, the, in this one here in, in orange, we know what's the probability of, of a variable Y, given that we observed, we, we observed the value of the variable X. Uh, so it's a passive way of, uh, it, it's usually used for prediction. We, so we observe the variable and then we want to, to, to uh, infer what's the value of Y. In our case, we want the causal effect. We want the interventional distribution that says that uh, if I perform an, an intervention, like if I change the, ver the value of X, what will happen with, with, uh, with the variable Y? There is an action here, a decision. So this is decision-making. So every time that we want to do decision-making, we have to do causal inference. So suppose we want to, to, to infer this uh, interventional distribution and we have available different data sets, data set one, two, two N. Um, as I said before, these data sets are messy because they are different in several dimensions. For example, we could have the data set one 
uh, with data collected in Los, Los Angeles. In data set two, uh, the data was collected in New York. In data set N, in Lisbon. Um, in, in the first one, we had an experiment there. So the, the data is experimental. And when we say that the data, the, we have an experimental data, we, we also, also have to say what, the, what variable has been randomized. So it's not always the same. So in this case here, the assignment of the values of the variable Z1 has been randomized. So it's an experiment where the variable Z1 is the treatment variable. In, this, in the second data set, the data was collected in a passive way. It's an it's a observational study. And in, the, in the, the last one here, we randomized the assignment of the var variable Z2. So the, the, the treatment variable is different from the first one. Um, we could also have differences in the sampling procedure, in, in the way that the data, that the, the sample has been selected. So this is different from confounding bias, if you know what I'm talking, what, what I'm saying here. But this is how can sometimes that is a preference in the way that we select the the uh, the individuals in the sample. So in the first one, we could have a, a, a we could. We, we could have a favor to young people. So that is a selection bias due to the age. Um, so we don't have, the sample here is not, uh, it's not representing very well the proportion, the age proportion in the, in, the, in the population. In the second data set, we could have a selection bias due to, the, to uh, some socioeconomic status. And in the data, data set N, uh, the, the sample was, was random. Uh, the people were selected at random. The last dimension is uh, about the variables that have been measured in each study here. So suppose that we have uh, here we have variables in the, in the first time point. We measured variable X, Z1, and Y1. Uh, in the second study, we haven't measured the variable Y1 in the first, in the, in the first uh, time point, but we have measured N, while here we haven't measure, measured the N. So the variables are different. That's the point. The, the, the columns of the data set are different across these studies. So we, we have here four dimensions. The first dimension is the population. Uh, so they can be different in the population. The second dimension is the experimental design. It could be observational or could be experimental uh, uh, study. The third dimension is the sampling procedure. And the fourth dimension is this uh, set of variables that have been measured. So uh, with these dimensions, this causal data fusion dimensions in mind, um, I would like to start with some common inferences in scientific circles, AI and machine learning that, are, that involve some standard assumptions. And so I would like to connect those uh, data fusion uh, dimensions with the tasks that we've been working on. So the first one is, is the one that we, uh, we know a lot. It's, a, it's, the it's, a, it's the inference that's common in statistics or in probability theory, where we have samples. And we want to use the samples to infer the distribution in the population. So we have uh, a, a sample with a finite number of observations. In, the, in this case, that we are talking about observational study here. And then I want to infer um, the distribution of this event or phenomenon. And I. There, there are a lot of fundamental uh, results here that allow us to do this, this inference. And uh, I, uh, I, I give credit here to Bernoulli, Poisson, Komogorov, mostly due to this uh, huge uh, results like, like law of large numbers, central limit theory, that, 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 that delta method that allow us to do uh, this inductive uh, task of, of moving from the finite samples to the, to the distribution. Now, uh, now moving to the experimental side. In the experimental side, uh, we have this uh, ingenious idea of uh, introducing randomization of the uh, treatment assignment because th this procedure, this random randomized procedure, minimize the confounding bias. Uh, uh, and the confounding bias is, the, is what hurts 
inferences, uh, causal inference from observational studies. So just by randomizing the, the, the treatment assignment, we can remove this uh, confounding bias. So the sample or the data that we collect from this controlled experiments, from this controlled and randomized experiments are already causal. So uh, the data is already under the intervention on do X. And we just need to move from the uh, sample with a finite number of observations that are already there in the interventional world to the distribution also leaving the interventional world. So basically we are moving from the samples to the distribution, but keeping the same road here, both in tasks A and B. And the, the task C is the one that we are changing the world now. So we have uh, we could have samples as well, but then we, we, we estimated the observational distribution here in, in A. And uh, now with the observational distribution, I would like to infer the interventional distribution as if I had conducted the experiment. So I haven't conducted the experiment, but I want to use the observational data to know something as if all this confounding bias has been removed. So uh, I, th this, is, this has been studied since 1974. And I say here that until uh, 2011, because this has been solved. So this was mainly concerned about confounding bias. So how can we remove the confounding bias from the observational data to have the information as if we had conducted the experiment? And this is mostly by Rubin, Robbins, David, and also bar pro. So what you, you ask me now, uh, what are you saying? Are, are we done? So all these are known things when this causal, uh, causal data science comes into play. Uh, now uh, I would like to come back to these dimensions, the causal data fusion dimensions, uh, just to understand what's happening here. So most of these tasks have been uh, studied uh, ha have been applied under, uh, we, we, we have fixed it here. So the dimensions one, three, and four are fixed. And then we are just uh, concerned about inferences changing the dimension two. The dimension two is about the experimental design, but we are talking about the same population, the same sampling, sampling procedure, and the same measure variables have been measured. So we are, we are in this, um, constrained scenario where everything has been fixed, uh, 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 but not the, the, the second dimension. So um, question here, the, 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 sorry. Come back here. Uh, something has been, all right. So do these dimensions exhaust all possible data collection modes? And the answer is no. So uh, there are a lot of studies also. So I, I'm just copying here the first, the, at the first test, the one that, that was in the previous slide, that's about the causal inference from observational studies. This is by Rubin, Robbins, David, and Pro. But uh, we have also studies that uh, I, I like to call here as experimental inference, but many people know, know this as generalized instrumental variables. And there is this nice work by uh, Philip and Seal uh, Wright in 1928, uh, where um, they, they went to do this inference. So you have data under, under the uh, randomization of some variable Z, so you have an experiment, but the experiment in this experiment, we are randomizing the variable Z, but you are interested in the interventional distribution under the randomization of the variable X. So in an intervention of the variable on the variable X. So how can we move from these two uh, different experiments? And this has been done most, uh, mostly in, in, in the scenario where you are assuming uh, linear relationships but this has been done for a long time. Uh, also in the dimension of sampling procedure. Uh, so when we have sampling or selection bias, 
um, the, this professor, James Heckman, it's a professor in the University of Chicago. Uh, he shows uh, one instance when it's possible to recover from selection bias. So if you have data uh, that has have some preference on age, for example, in some cases, in some settings, it, it is possible to do the inference as if we have the same proportions in the population. So without the, the, the selection bias. So it, it, sometimes it's, this, this task is feasible. And the last task here we call transportability. This is to ensure external validity. So usually if you are uh, collecting data in one population, but you want to do inference in a different, in, other, uh, dif uh, in a different population, uh, we have to do this transportability analysis. So the, 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 the effect that you are, uh, ob that, that's obtained in one population, not always is valid in an external or different population. So we are trying to ensure here external validity. So for example, if you do some experiment, experiments in bonobos, it's a type of monkeys, you want to understand if the same conclusions could be, uh, are valid in, in humans. Uh, this could be populations as, as well, like if you are uh, collecting data in LA, can we do uh, inference in New York? So how can we move the, the, the knowledge from one population or from one scenario to another? And this has been studied by Shadish, Shadish Cook and Campbell since 1976. Uh, oh, this is just uh, what I said, like sometimes you have data from, their, from the UCLA and then you want to uh, see if the, the results are valid in Columbia University, for example, in New York. So all these special cases, all, so all, all these tasks that are, I just mentioned are special cases of the dimensions, of the data fusion dimensions, and they have been addressed in the, in the literature mostly in isolation uh, and also in very special in spe special par parametric conditions, for example, linear. Uh, so, but in practice, all these dimensions, difference in all these dimensions appear all, all together. So what we are calling here as causal data science is how can we infer causal effects by uh, making this data fusion accounting for difference in all these different dimensions when they appear at the same time. Uh, in this tutorial, uh, I, would like, uh, I would like to talk a little bit more about the first and the fourth uh, tasks here, so about causal inference from observation studies and also about transportability. So this is our outline. In the first part of the tutorial, I will talk, uh, I will explain what's the causal model. So if you are uh, familiar, this book here, The Book of Why, is a very nice book by Udair Pro and Dana McKenzie. And they have a very nice introduction about the causal inference. Um, we will introduce the structure causal model. So the causal model is called here in our theory as a structure called causal model or SCM, SCM. The, the, the SCM induces the pro-causal hierarchy. Uh, that is this uh, report, the R60 here in causalai.net. It's a, a book chapter uh, about the foundations of causal inferences. It's, it's a very nice book chapter. So if you are interested, if you are interested in more details about the, what's the causal model and the theories behind it, uh, it, it I re really recommend you to check this, the, the, this material. Uh, so the structural causal model, it induces the pro-causal pro hierarchy, the PCH, and also the causal hierarchy theorem, the CH, uh, CHT. Uh, I will talk about this uh, all these three topics during uh, the, the first part of the tutorial. And then after the break, uh, I will talk about more, uh, you'll be a more specific talk about what are the methods in causal inference from observational studies, and also the dimension of the data fusion when we are talking about transportability. So uh, the transportability is, is how can we extrapolate experimental finds across different populations. So uh, starting here, the first part, what's the causal model? 
uh, causal model, or it, it's called here for us, a structural causal model, but it's the data generating model. Suppose, for example, that we have a drug, and uh, the drug that that that's the, the the treatment variable for us. So the the drug has been assigned. Uh, the the assignment of the drug is is that uh, depends on the the age of the person, for example, and also depends on uh, a lot of other variables that are unmeasured. So there is this variable U that uh, combines all these other factors that affect the assignment of a drug, if a person is taking a drug or not. And we want to understand uh, the headache. So are you, is the head, I, I, you, I have an, a headache, headache if I don't take the drug or if I take the drug. So this depends on the drug, the drug and also depends on the age. So this is the uh, data generating module. So I have this very simple, it's a, a very simple example here with just two functions. But just to ex exemplify here, uh, if I have these assignments here, then the causal diagram you have, we will have in the causal diagram an arrow pointing to the variable every time that, that this variable here is an argument of the function of, of the other variable. So suppose that X is the drug. So in our case, the drug depends on age. So that's why we have the zero into X here from Z age to drug X. And the headache depends on the age and the drug. That's why we have an arrow from X to Y and a variable from Z to Y. So this is the scenario. If you, if you observe or if you, have, if you collect observations from this word here, you can estimate the observational distribution. This is the reality. The reality is there and observer, uh, uh, collecting data from this reality, you give us just uh, observations that help us to estimate the observational distribution. But when we have an intervention, we have a different model. It's a model when the drug has been set, we, we set the value of drug as yes, for example. So it's a, a specific, a certain value of the drug. In this case, it's yes, the person take, uh, took the drug. And we want to understand what happened with the headache in this specific assignment. So again, uh, we will have the, same, the, the, the causal graph here, but in the case of the X, there is no influence of age here when we do the intervention. The, the intervention is setting the variable of X as yes, and that's it. So we remove all the arrows that are into X here in this scenario. Note here that this is a, a hypothetical scenario. We don't have, we, we unless you do run, uh, a randomized procedure here to, to minimize or to reduce the confounding bias that are represented as variables that are into X, that are connected with an arrow into X, uh, this interventional scenario is hypothetical. So uh, what we want to do here is actually, um, sorry, uh, yeah. So what we want to do here is to get data from this world, uh, world the observational world, and do inference as if, we, we don't have any other influence in the assignment of the variable X. So if you are familiar with the potential outcome framework, uh, this, is the, is, this is the notation for the causal effect. So the causal effect or the intervention distribution is given this intervention denoted by the, the operator do, but in the potential outcome notation, this is, we use this uh, sub X here, so, but they are the same. Uh, for us, they are the same here. And, uh, and look here that we, we are interested in a decision. So we are going to make a decision about taking a drug or not. We want to infer the outcome. So we want to infer the effect of this decision on some outcome Y. And we, want, we have all these other covariates that are affecting the assignment of the variable X and also the, the outcome. Uh, this is another example, uh, maybe a bit closer to people in the natural language processing. So suppose that we have uh, the product rating. So you are on uh, Amazon, for example, and you have this five, one to five star rating for, for some product. And we want the, the rating here, the person that is giving the rating 
uh, we have the age of this person, we have other factors of the persons of, of the people. So depends on the on, on other factors, the, the rating of the product. And also the, set, the, the sales performance here depends on the rating, but also depends on the age of the, the, the person that's buying the project and, and many other factors that are unobserved here. So the graph is the same, it's just as, as an illustration here. I, I'm just uh, giving another context, but we, 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 we could be uh, interested here in, in the effect of this rating of the product in the sales performance. So in the intervention, we, in this interventional scenario, we would like to see the effect of sales performance when the product has five star, a rate of five stars. So it, it is the same here. But note that in the real, in reality, in, we don't the all these me, these mechanisms here are unknown. They are not observed. What we can try to to uh, so the causal graph here are actually a, a coarser a coarser description of these models here, where we don't need to uh, specify what's the form of the functions. We don't need to say if they are. Uh, linear, nonlinear. We, we, we just need to, to inform here, it's a description about what variables are argument of the functions of the others. This is all that we need in the causal diagram. Uh, so even if we don't have this information about the, the, the form of the functions or even about the distribution of these uh, external variables or unobserved variables, we can draw the causal diagram. And the, the task here is how can we move from this uh, world where we are just seeing, so it's a passive way of getting the data. So we are observing data. So how can we move from the observational world to this world where we are performing this intervention, where we are doing some decision here? Uh, the, the definition of structure causal model is in chapter seven here of the causality book by Pro. Uh, I would like to give a, a more formal definition of this structure causal model. So it's it's a tuple a tuple here where the first is a set of variables that are observed. We call them as endogenous variables. So those are the variables that we have available. Uh, we have also these unobserved variables that we call it as U. So we have the set U of variables that are exogenous, are latent, or unobserved. We have also a collection of functions that determine the, val the value of the variables in, in the set V. So all the observed variables are a function of other variables that are observed. So this, these other variables that are argument of the variable v VI are called parents of VI, but they are also a function of other unobserved variables in, in new here. So, uh, we have this assignment here. Uh, note that they are all endogenous variables. And we also have the distribution of the variables U, the variables in U here that they, they are unobserved. So this is the structural causal model. And the structural causal model implies the pro causal hierarchy. Uh, what, is, what does this mean? Uh, if you if you read the, the, the book of the book of why uh, this is called the letter of causation. Um, what is the letter here? So in the first the first rung of the letter, so in the first level, we have the association. So it's the uh, it's where all the observational data is living, or where we we can do prediction here. So we can compute conditional distributions. The, the, the conditional distribution of y given x, that given that I observe the variable x, what I can say about the variable y. Or uh, as an example here, what does a symptom tell us about the disease? So I'm just observing and then trying to do prediction. So in this level here in, uh, is where most of the classical statistics lives. Uh, so machine learning, uh, regression analysis, all this uh, classical and uh, the, all all these cl classical data science tools are living in the associational uh, rung, in the associational level. So everything that you you can say 
when you do some uh, when we do some associational an analysis is about predictions. You cannot say about inf uh, causal inference here. Now we have the second rung. Is that it's another rung of the of the ladder here, or the second level? It's a different level where we do interventions. So here is the notation. We have the probability under the intervention on the variable x. Uh, x. Sometimes you have some other covariates here, so C specific effects. But what's the effect on some variable y? So this is the notation. And note here that the typical activity is doing. So we are performing. We want to see what will happen with the variable y when we change, when we make the action of changing the variable x. So this is a decision-making uh, task. Uh, so as an example, what if I take aspirin? Will my headache be cured? So I want to make an action. What will happen with my headache? And the third rung of the ladder is about counterfactuals. Uh, this is uh, the typical activity here is about imagining re retrospection. So it's a different level. Uh, in this case here, I want to see, suppose that I took the aspirin uh, and, and I want to ask it, if I hadn't, if I hadn't, if I haven't taken the, the, the aspirin, would my head be stopped? Like it's a, a retrospection uh, reasoning here. And this is the notation uh, for the, the counterfactual, uh, for, for, for counterfactuals. So the idea here is how to do cross layer inferences, right? We, we are here in, suppose that we are here. So the data actually is here in the first layer where we are just observing data. And we want to infer something about the layer two. So we are, we are collecting data in the, in the first layer, in the layer one, the associational layer. But we want to do a cross-layer inference. So we want to infer something in a higher level in the interventional layer. So as I said, the data is coming from the first layer. Uh, this is most of the available data is observational or passively collected. But the output, the query that we, the, the research question is about causal effects, uh, like it's a effect of some public policy, some treatment, some decision. Um, so how can we use the data collected from observations that are in the layer one to answer questions about interventions in the layer two? Um, so why this is a hard problem? The, the challenge here is that in almost any field, the, the, the structural causal model is not observed. So we have the causal model, it is there, is the data generating model, it's, the rea it's modeling the reality, it's the nature. Uh, we have some exceptions in physics, chemi chemistry, sometimes we understand what are these functions, but in most of the cases, we don't have it, the, the SCM. But the SCM induces all the distributions that uh, with the, with the, we talked in the pearl causal hierarchy. So from the SCM, we have the observational distribution, we have the interventional distribution, and we have the counterfactual distribution. All, all of them are coming from the SCM. As I said, they are, the SCM is not known. We don't observe the SCM. But we want to use data, that's the observational or the observational distribution here, and we want to, to infer something about the inter, uh, that, that comes from the interventional distribution. So we want to move from this un, an observed nature and get something and, and say something about some observed phenomena. Uh, that is this. So again, uh, the task here is to infer the causal quantity. So the query here is denoted as this probability of y given to x that's in the layer two but we want to use just observational data that's in the layer one. There is, this, uh, the, there is a theorem here. I, I will skip the, the formal version, but the informal version says that for almost any SEM, for almost any structural causal model, um, and this includes almost any possible environment, the PCH, the pro causal hierarchy, does not collapse. Does not collapse means that the layers of the hierarchy remain distinct. 
And as a corollary here, uh, we say that we cannot answer a question that's in layer uh, I. So suppose that we want to answer a question in layer two. We cannot answer a question in layer two just using uh, data that lives in, a, in the layer one. We need information that lives in the layer two or higher. So we need information that, that's in the same layer to answer questions in that layer. So after all, how are causal inferences possible given this result? Um, and uh, what I want to say here is that even though we don't have the, the, the structure causal model, we can have the causal diagram. We have algorithms that can help to learn the causal diagram. Usually it, 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 it's not possible to learn just from the data since the data is just information from the layer one. Uh, it's it not always possible to learn the complete causal diagram, but we have to use prior knowledge or expert or domain knowledge to uh, complete the causal diagram. Or sometimes, sometimes uh, it's even possible to do inference just using the output of the, the algorithm, the structure learning algorithm. But the, the important result here is that it's not possible to do causal inference without a causal diagram. The causal diagram is actually encoding structure assumptions, and those structure assumptions are the assumptions that live in the layer two. So everything that we need that's not in the layer one, but it's in layer two to answer questions about, in the, about uh, layer two are encoded in the causal diagram. So uh, sometimes we, so uh, again, I, I want to stress this point because it's important. The assumptions, so all the assumptions about the model are in the, in the causal diagram, they are qualitative. They are not about the, the, the form of the functions or about the, the, the distributions of the, the variables. We just need, the only information that we need is about the relationship about the variables. So what variables argument of the functions of the order? We don't need to write the analytic form of the functions here. Uh, so, what is the causal diagram? So let's see what's the causal diagram here uh, as the encoder of structural assumptions. So that is a procedure to build the graph. Uh, I, I mentioned a, a little bit before, but we have this SCM, M, and it, the, the SCM implies the causal diagram. So for every endogenous variable, we will have a node in the graph for this variable. Also, we will have a directed arrow encoding the functional dependencies. As I said before, we have an arrow from the argument to the variable. And we also have bidirected arrows. So these bidirected arrows encode possible associations among the exogenous sources of variations. Let's just give an example here. So I have three variables, Z, uh, that depends only on some external variables. X depends on Z, Y depends on X. So the causal diagram here is a chain. So again here, Z depends only on external factors. So it's not appear here in the graph. X depends only on Z and Y depends only on X. And that is this assumption here that the, the external variables of X that affect X, the external variables that affect Z and the external variables that affect Y, they are independent. So that's why we don't have here any bidirected arrow. However, I could have this other example here where um, I have that Z is affected by UZ. So these external variables, X is affected by Z, Y is affected by Z and X. But the only assumption that I can, I can make here about the external factors is that the external factors affecting X are independent of the others affecting Z and Y. So we could have a correlation between these variables here, which means that I could have a variable uh, here in the middle affecting both Z and Y. Those are called confounders. So they are creating a confounding bias between the relationship between Z and Y here. And every time that I cannot make the assumption that these external factors are independent, I have to add this by directed arrow. So this is the causal diagram. Um, 
And when we have the causal diagram, we have some testable, testable implications. So from the data, so how can we say that the causal diagram is actually compatible with the data that we have observed? So one, uh, one thing that we can read off these causal diagrams is our conditional independences. So if you have a conditional independence test, every separation that you have, I, I will define what separation here, but every separation in the graph implies some independence in the, in the, in the probability distribution P. So we have, we have to look at triplets. So for every three variables, we, we, we look at the, the connection between these three variables. And there are three types of connections here. We call this first one as chain, the second one as the reverse chain, and this other one as the fork. So all these three triplets have this normal uh, behavior where they are uh, dependent marginally. So that is this flow of information going from X to, to Z to X, from X to, to Y through Z. So there is a flow of information here. That's why X is dependent of Y marginally. However, if I condition on Z, all these three uh, triplets here uh, are blocked. We say that they are blocked because the flow of information stops. Uh, so in this case, the X is independent of Y given the variable Z. So th th this is the normal behavior. We have this abnormal uh, triplet here that we call it as the Z here is a collider, if you know him. Uh, this concept here. So Z is a collider. So in this case, uh, the default, uh, the, this is also the same case here. We have a collider, uh, the W here. So in this case, if I condition on Z, right? So X, in, in this case, X, you be dependent of Y given Z. If I condition on Z, I'm blocking I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm opening the flow of information. So this is abnormal. So this is the, the opposite of the other tri uh, tri uh, triplets. If I condition on Z here, I open this flow of information. And the default here is that if I do not, I do not condition on Z, so marginally X and Y are already uh, independent. This path, these triplets here are already blocked without conditioning on the collider. Uh, so I'm talking here about triplets. Uh, how, what I can say about larger graphical structures. Um, that is this notion uh, about this separation. Uh, a path between X and Y is said to be inactive if at least one triplet is, is inactive given a set Z. So as an example here, we have four. It's a bit, <laughs> a bit larger than the other ones, but it's uh, a good example. So we have this tri triplet here, and we have this triplet here. I just need one to be blocked. So if I condition on B, this triplet you, you, you be blocked, so the entire path is blocked. The same for, for uh, W. If I condition it on W, then I'm blocking this triplet here, and I just need one triplet to block the entire path. So uh, as a result here, I have that X is independent of Y, given Z, where Z could be just B or just W, or I could even, even condition on both here, B and W. Uh, this is another example where B is a collider. So as I said, this is triplet here is already blocked because of the collider. Uh, so in this case, X is independent of Y given the empty set, because this triplet is already negative. Uh, but I could condition on W, then I would have the two triplets uh, blocked. And I, I could even open this collider if I'm closing this other one. So it's okay to condition on both because at least I have one triplet that's blocked. Uh, this is another example. I have now two colliders. So in this case, I can open one of the colliders, but I cannot open both. So in this case, X is independent of Y given Z, in the, given the empty set, given the W, or given the B, but not given both. So this separation, so we say that two variables are disseparated given Z, so X and Y are disseparated given Z, if every path between these two variables are inactive. So we have to look 
we have to look at all the paths between X and Y and do this exercise here uh, to see if the variables in Z are blocking all these paths. Uh, I would like to show some examples on Fusion. So I said that we have this web app. Uh, this is the, the Fusion. Can you see my screen? Um, am I sharing this part here of the Fusion? Yes, all right. So this is Fusion. Uh, we have a lot of uh, features here. It's actually amazing. I really recommend you to try. Uh, I will try just to show the first graph here. I will draw the graph just to, to show you how to do it. So this node, this here creates, creates a node. So I can create like a variable v1, then a, var a variable v2, and a variable v3. Um, let's create some paths here. So suppose this is a chain. We have a chain here. Uh, let's just align this one here. And I could do some disseparation analysis, some path analysis here. So I want to ask, is V1 independent of V3 marginally? And the U answer and the, the app answer is that the sets are not disseparated. So th that is this flow of information. This is a normal triplet. So that is this flow of information. But if I condition on V2, I will block this triplet. So the app says to me that they are disseparated. I could make this a little bit more complicated, like this case here. Uh, in this case, I have to, I want to know if V1 and V3 are independent, given some set. And so this is a tricky one because that is this path here that I have to block. So that's open. So I have to condition on V2 to block it. But if I condition on V2, I'm opening this other path. So this is a graph where V1 and V3 are not separable by any set. So V1 and V3 are marginally dependent and also they are dependent given Z2. Uh, I have other examples here. This is the fork. Uh, so again, X independent of Y. They are not marginally, but they are uh, given Z. So this is the disseparation um, uh, function. We have also this testable implication. So given a graph, I can, the, the, the app here lists, lists all the, the condition independences that we have. Let's see the other one that I had before. We see that there are no condition independences. If I remove the, the arrow here, we will have that V1 and V3 is independent of V2. So this is a very nice app. Just, uh, this is just one of the, fun the, 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 the functionality of the app. Um, I will try to go over some of the of, of them during the tutorial. Oh, the, just this other example. This is the collider. As I said, X is independent of Y marginally because the, there is a collider here. So this is the default. They are already, this uh, triplet is already blocked. Uh, conditioning on Z, let's see here. Conditioning on Z, we have that X is independent of Y marginally. But if you're conditioned on Z, they are not separated. So it's, it's fun, like we can learn a lot just using this uh, app, but it, it, people are also using, I use, uh, use it a lot to do research. So we have all the, uh, all the algorithms that we've been uh, developing the lab, they, we are trying to implement here in the app. So it's also good for research. Um, okay, uh, so we, we have these examples on Fusion. Um, uh, do you want to make a break? I think I did, uh, it, it was a bit faster than I thought. Um, some questions, maybe I can take some questions from this first part. Yes, you yes, can do. Yeah. Hello? Yes, I think it's, it's a good moment if, if you want to make a break here, even if you went a bit early, it's fine. Then you can take some questions. Right. There's, there's, uh, a, there's at least four that I can see in the Q&A. All right. So any questions? Maybe the monitors can relay the questions. I think the, uh, do you see there's a Q&A okay. panel in Zoom? Yeah. I can uh, read the questions. Uh, there's actually only two. Uh, the okay. other ones are just comments. 
so the first one is, could oh, you- sorry. I, I'm seeing here the question and answer. I yeah. wasn't uh, following it. Uh, yeah. So could you recall again, what's the general underlying definition of causation you assume in this work? A tempor temporal dependence of random variables of some kind. Okay. Um, so as I said here, we, we use definition as if we are in a randomized control, control trial. So uh, the meaning of intervention, let me come back here in this structure causal model, is when we set uh, this one here. So we set a variable in a specific va value. So this is the meaning of, co uh, of causal effect. So what's the effect of this variable X on Y? As if all the confounding is removed. So we don't have any variable that's affecting the assignment of the variable X, the treatment variable here. So it's exactly the same definition as the randomized con control trial. Um, when we have temporal dependence, we also have to do the same type of, uh, of analysis because sometimes we have some covariates affecting the, the treatment and the outcome. So this could be just the step one of the, the, the time series. So, uh, we, are, we, we cannot be sure that the X is affecting Y uh, just because one is coming before than the other in, in, in this temporal axis. It, it could be possible that X is, dep is dependent of Y. Uh, let me just use fusion here. So suppose that this is the X1 and this is the X2. So we have a, a time series data here. So one is coming before the other. I could have this dependence here, right? So they are dependent. So you observe a dependence between X1 and X2. And then they are, well, X1 is not causing the other because if I had here uh, randomized the assignment of X1, I would remove all these confounders and I would see that X1 is completely independent of X2. So the, the temporal dependency sometimes is useful. So when we, we do analysis, causal inference analysis using uh, longitudinal data or time, time series data, it's useful to use this information that you have. It's a prior knowledge that one variable is coming before the other, but this whole analysis of causal inference is still needed, right? We, we want to know if there is this effect here. Like the direct, it's a direct effect, not necessarily direct. It, it could be a mediator here, but it's it, if, if I remove all the other confounding, uh, all, all the confounders variables here, I still have uh, an influence of the variable X1 in the variable X2. Did I answer your question? Uh, okay. All right, uh, the slides you showed in the mute time have answered, okay, oh, open. How do we go from data to the structure causal model? If we don't have a model of how, do, how different variables influence the output, do we need to test different structures using, uh, for example, previous knowledge about the task, or is there any other way of creating the model? Uh, so as I said, the we need, we need some information about it, the, the, the structure causal model, but the only information that we need, uh, where is it now? Is the causal diagram. Here is the causal diagram. The causal diagram is not the structure causal model. So uh, we don't need to go from data to the structure causal model. We only need to go from data to the causal diagram. That's a, a coarser description of the structure causal model. We don't need to say what's the form of the functions and we don't need to assume anything about the distribution of the variables. It could be Gaussian, it could be um, uh, any other type of distribution here, non-Gaussian, any, any type of distribution. We could, we could have heterocedastic uh, variants. We could have any, any of these problems that we've been dealing with in statistics. Uh, we still you need to do uh, these statistics when we are 
moving from samples to the distribution. But here it's another task. We want to move from the observational distribution to the intervention distribution. And we cannot do this just using data, but we can do that just using the causal diagram. That's a qualitative description of this model. And there are some algorithms, they are called structure causal, uh, structure ca uh, causal structure learning algorithms. Uh, we have, for example, the FCI algorithm that can uh, learn even when we don't observe all the variables in the system. So uh, let's see if I have here an example with the bidirected arrows. Uh, so we could learn this graph sometimes uh, depending on the data. We could learn even with the where it's possible to have a bidirected arrow. But usually, since we are using just data, usually this, this uh, recovering is not, uh, we, we say that the, 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 the recovery is not identified. We cannot uniquely identify the true graph. It's usually a partially directed uh, causal graph. But we can use prior knowledge as you are referring here. So there are a lot of other uh, developments in the field that, try, that are trying to combine experimental data that you have available. Uh, we also have some, uh, some algorithms that make, uh, that use temporal knowledge. So this is about the other question. Sometimes if you know the ordering about these variables, you can use this in the, in the, in the cause structure learning. Um, sometimes you do some parametrical uh, assumptions. There is uh, this Lingan method uh, that can uniquely identify the causal diagram, but they are, it, it makes very strong assumptions about the variables being uh, non-Gaussian and the, the, the relationships being linear. So if you are in a very constrained scenario, sometimes you can uniquely uh, identify the causal structure. Um, but the idea here is how can we uh, be the less committal as possible? Like I don't need to, to write the, the equation. Sometimes I can do causal inference, uh, having uncertainties here. So if, if, you, if you have knowledge from the, from the domain, like you have domain knowledge to by hand draw this causal diagram, and uh, sometimes it's possible, you can just use it. You can just construct by hand. It's not, it's not a problem, but th these are assumptions. So every analysis here are under the assumption that the causal graph is the correct one, right? Sometimes you can try to learn from data when you have no knowledge about, about, the, about the system, underlying system, but then you'll be uh, in this constraint scenario that sometimes the causal effect is not identifiable. We'll see more uh, afterwards. Um, how about causal reinforcement learning? Is that what it is? This is a, a, line of uh, a line of research that we've been working a lot in the lab. Uh, that is, if you are interested on this, uh, that is this website that we, it's our website, it's the crl.causalai.net. Um, let me answer here, just crl.causalai.net. Where we have a lot of resources there, including a tutorial by Professor Byron Boyne. I, I, I believe it's a three, three hour tutorial about this topic. It's a, a very exciting topic where we are combining uh, reinforcement learning with causal inference. And the whole idea here is also to leverage uh, the causal diagram. So we are embedding the causal diagram uh, in the agent so you can learn much faster and do much more uh, robust decision-making using the causal diagram. I really recommend you to check this, this website. Um, right, uh, any other question? All right, um, again, uh, I really recommend you to sign up in the causal fusion app. This is, let me move here to the, Oh, here. So the Causal Fusion uh, website here, uh, I really recommend you to sign up. And uh, if you don't have an educational email, 
a dot edu point uh, dot edu email please send me a message and uh, i'll make sure that you be uh, that your account will be created all right uh, i think we can go to the break yeah um, yeah what what do right. you think like 10 minutes 15 minutes what what are your thoughts um i i think you can decide i think the the plan was 30 minutes i think this is too much i can i can continue after it, 15 minutes if it you was, think it's better the original plan is like 30 minutes at the middle of the talk but if you want you can make like two small breaks like oh this would be yeah. very good all right i think this okay. would be very good so let's mm. try uh 15 minutes and okay. then after the second after in the middle of the second part we do another break okay great cool. all right you. okay you. Thanks. so reminder Thanks. to students complete the the feedback form right right now if you don't do it yet right now you probably your data would get into the final stats thanks Okay. <laughs> um, it's nice to see some Portuguese here. <laughs> right. Um, yes, uh, I just checked your, um, some of you already uh, signed up in the Causal Fusion app. Uh, that's really nice, really, really nice. Uh, I already gave access to some of you. Uh, that is this one. Uh, uh, Anna Capilla, yeah, I will check after the tutorial uh, your uh, subscription and I will approve you. Uh, thank you. Let me just uh, add here as a note. Right, um, no worries. Okay, let's start. Uh, I will share my screen again. Right. Um, so it, welcome back, everyone. Uh, so in this part of the tutorial, uh, I will talk uh, uh, a little a little more specific about the the causal inference tools and the data fusion tools. Um, so just uh, as a recall, here we have these tasks that I, I mentioned before, and now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the task one, that's the causal inference for film observational studies. So how can we answer this query here, the probability of y given to x? So how can we infer the interventional distribution by using the observational distribution and the causal graph? So now we have these two inputs, the observational distribution, the causal graph. As I said, it's necessary to have the causal graph. Uh, how can we do this? How can you use these two inputs to infer the interventional distribution? This is remain, uh, just a, a recall. Uh, this is a cross layer inference. So we use the causal diagram to use data or the observational distribution uh, to infer uh, the interventional distribution under the, for example, under the intervention on X. The first criterion that I would like to talk here is the vector criterion. This is the, the classical one. Uh, it's the simplest also one. So we have this definition here. So a set Z satisfies the backdoor criterion or BDC with respect to an ordinary pair uh, X, Y, where X is the treatment, Y is the outcome. So we have X and we want to see the effect of X on Y. But that is the set Z here. Let's see what, what are the, the requirements. So if the set Z, uh, if no variable in Z is a descendant of X, so Z is a pretreatment or it's a set of covariates, they come before X. So this is the first requirement. The sec second requirement is that Z blocks every path between X and Y that, that has an arrow into X. So this path is here, so that is this, path that's out of X, I, uh, this is a causal path in this case. So I, I'm not wor worrying about this path here. I'm just worrying about these other paths that are into X. So those are the confounding paths. I need to block all these confounding paths to know, uh, they, to, to just have the influence that are going to this directed path from X to Y. So if I have the set Z here, 
that blocks these all paths, then this set Z satisfies the backdoor criteria. So a way to, uh, this is a procedure to find the backdoor set Z. It's just remove, we can remove from the graph all the outgoing arrows from Y, all, all the paths that has this out, outgoing arrow from X. Uh, this graph is called GX, uh, GX underscore. And uh, so I, I, I create this graph here, and then I check using the separation uh, criteria that I just, criterion that I just uh, mentioned to you that all these other paths, all these remaining paths are blocked. So in this case, by conditioning on Z, we block this fork. So we have a fork here. So conditioning on Z, we block this one. There is another path here that X, Z through this bidirected arrow. So also conditioning on Z, we are blocking this other path. So in this case, just the, the set that contains just the variable Z, it's uh, satisfying the backdoor criteria. So if the set Z satisfies the backdoor criterion, then uh, X, the effect of X on Y is identifiable and it's given by this expression here. So, um, Uh, just a note here for those that understand the potential outcome framework, the, the, uh, the backdoor scenario or the case where we have a set Z that, that blocks all the backdoor paths or all the confounding paths, it's exactly the same as assuming the ignorability uh, condition. So we, in the potential outcome framework, if you are familiar with this framework, there sometimes we have to assume the, the condition that, that Z is conditional ignorable that's written in this way here. Uh, sometimes it's not actually very clear from just this expression what this means. And using the, the graphical approach of causal inference, we know that uh, this uh, conditional ignorability, this assumption of conditional ignorability is exactly the one that uh, blocks all the backdoor paths. So if a set Z is backdoor admissible, then Z is conditional ignorable, right? Uh, so if you are assuming uh, conditional ignorability, we are under the setting where all the backdoor paths can be blocked by the set Z. And there is also this propensity score matching. It's a very popular approach to estimate this expression because you look at this expression here, it seems a little bit hard to estimate. Uh, so in this case of the backdoor uh, adjustment, so this formula is called backdoor adjustment. In this specific case, we have, we, we have uh, this following trick here. Uh, we can multiply by the probability of X given Z in the denominator and also in the denominator. So we are just multiplying by one here. There is not no change in the expression. We can do that. And if you note here in the denominator, we have exactly the factorization of the joint distribution of X, Y, and Z. So in the numerator, we can rewrite as exactly the joint distribution. So the, in this specific case of the backdoor adjustment, so it's, it's just in this specific scenario, we can, use, we can estimate the causal effect by rewriting the, the, the joint distribution by the conditional distribution of X given Z. And this, this, this denominator here is called propensity score that could be estimated by using neural networks or any, uh, or any other um, a, a statistical method you can use your favor here. So it's a, a really nice because for high dimensional cases, for high dimensional settings, uh, it's really easy to estimate the, the, uh, the causal effect. But again, I want to stress here, all, only if the set Z satisfies the backdoor criteria, we can use the inverse probability weighting or propensity score to estimate the, the interventional distribution, right? Sometimes we, we just uh, want to compute the causal effect without looking at the causal graph using propensity score. Know that we are under the assumption that you have exactly this graph, this causal graph here, describing your underlying system. If this is not the case, you are doing a wrong analysis. Uh, so how can we move beyond the backdoor criterion? So Pro uh, developed the do calculus, uh, also known as causal calculus in 1995. 
And the causal calculus is, uh, consists of three inference rules. I don't want to go through all these rules here. You can check uh, the causality book. Uh, but the idea is that using some graphical conditions, we have uh, these graphical conditions ensures that some of these probabilities are, we have some invariances in the probability. So these allow us to move from the interventional case to the observational case, right? So using these rules, we have, uh, we can uh, create a derivation. So we, we will write the expression until we will have the expression for the, for the inter interventional distribution in terms of just the observational distribution. So this is just an example. This is a classic example of the front door. Uh, to derive the expression of the front door, that's this one here in the bottom, we have to use the, the rules of the calculus in this way. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not going over, uh, over this derivation, but the idea is that the interventional distribution, so under the do S, S uh, so in this case here, uh, I just want to mention the graph here, it's a, a classical scenario where one wants to understand what's the effect of smoking on cancer. And uh, uh, people during, uh, so this is, is a, a, a historical case because uh, when they, they were trying to prove that it smoke, uh, smoking causes cancer, a lot, of, a lot of people from the industry were, was claiming that you cannot, you cannot compute the effect because there are a lot of confounding here. So you cannot just use observational data to say about the causation, they, they, are, they were right about it because you could uh, have some bi-directed arrows here between S, smoking, and C, cancer. But then you could use, so they, uh, uh, they use here, this is the, the deposit of tear on lungs. So if this one here is a mediator between S and C, if this is the, the causal graph describing the scenario, you can use another estimate, uh, this front door adjustment here and, and remove the confounding. So in this procedure here, we are actually uh, manipulating the expression in a way that we are removing the confounding paths here, or we are adjusting or blocking these confounding paths. So if you see here, the probability under the do S, so under the, that we, given that we are changing, we are making the intervention of smoking, uh, we can compute the probability of cancer just using the last line here, just using uh, observational data. You see here, there is no do. So everything that we, we need here is, a, is a, without the do. So it's the observational distribution. So we can compute the causal effect or the interventional distribution just using the observational data. Uh, so this is a positive example. This is a positive instance. And when, this, when it's positive, we would say that the causal effect is identifiable. What this means? Uh, this means that this is supposed that this is the space of all structure, all the possible structure causal models. So it's a huge space here. Then we have all the models that are compatible with the causal graph G, right? One of the input is the causal diagram. So we can uh, select just those models that are compatible with the causal graph G. Now we also have the probability distribution. So we have the observational distribution. So there is another, another part of the space here where we have the models that are compatible with the observational distribution. So we are talking here about the, inter the intersection. So our model lives in this intersection. So the effect, the causal effect is said to be identifiable from the observational distribution and the causal graph if all the models that, that are here in the intersection, they have the same interventional distribution for all of them. So we don't need to know what's the true, the, the true model. This is, uh, so regardless of the model, for all of them, we will have the same result. We have the same conclusion. So just using the, the, the causal graph and the, the observation distribution, we could uh, say something about the interventional distribution in this case. This is a, a positive case. More formally, uh, what means here, uh, this means here that if we have two different models, so encoding two different, uh, different natures, two different underlying systems, and they are, uh, 
So the graph corresponding to the nature one and the graph corresponding to the nature two are exactly the same. Are both are the same? So they 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 uh, they share the graph is shared. The probability distribution that comes from the model one and that comes from the model two are also the same. And then we will have that the probability of uh, of y given to x coming from the model one is equal to the probability of y given to x in the coming from the model two, right? So uh, it's uh, I don't I don't care what's the truth or the the true causal model here because I I, I can uh, for all of them I will have the same answer. So I want to contrast 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 here with the no identifiable case. So again, if this is the, the, the entire space of all possible structural causal models, we will have the, the, the spaces uh, related to the causal graphs, compatible with the causal graphs, compatible with the, the probability distribution. But in the intersection, we have some models saying uh, that the probability the intervention distribution is one and another model saying that's another. So we cannot, uh, ignore what's the causal model here. So we cannot decide what's the, the, the intervention distribution, uniquely, uniquely decide what's the intervention and distribution. When this happens is because your uh, description of the, of the structure causal model is too weak. So the causal, the, there's no, uh, remember that the causal diagram is reflecting your current understanding about the underlying system. If you don't know much about the system, you have a lot of uh, bidirected arrows there. So you don't have much assumptions. Your assumptions are too weak to have to identify the, 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 the intervention distribution. In this case, you, you need to improve your causal diagram. You, you need to or add more variables. You have to observe more variables or uh, add some prior, uh, use some prior knowledge to remove some of the bidirected arrows, but using what you have now, it's not possible to uh, infer the causal effect. And uh, the do calculus as a, the, the, set of, the, the set of two rules that I said before, they are sound and complete, which means that uh, a quantity, that this quantity here, that's the intervention and distribution, is identifiable from the observational distribution and from the causal graph if and only if that is a derivation using the Dukalculus rules. So if that exists some derivation uh, that reduces the query using the do to another expression that does not depend depends on the, the, the do, this means that uh, the effect is identifiable. If there is no sequence of applications of the do calculus to do this to to, to reduce the expression to a, a do free uh, expression, it means that your current knowledge encoded in the causal graph it's uh, it's impossible just using this knowledge that you have now to actually infer the causal diagram. You you need to improve your causal model. Uh, so um, I would like to. Uh, elaborate a little bit more about this tension about the reality. Uh, so the, the underlying system where the data is coming from and our current understanding about the system that's encoded in the model and the data that we have collected from the system. Um, as I said, we have this well-defined role uh, that's described, is described by the SEM, by the structure causal model. And the structure causal model implies the uh, pro causal hierarchy, which means that uh, all these different, different aspects of the underlying system, all this observation, oh, this observational uh, reasoning, the uh, interventional reason, the, the counterfactual reasoning, all these different, these different aspects of the underlying, underlying nature and these types of behavior, they are all implied by this structure causal model. But we acknowledge that this collection of mechanisms are, uh, are not observed, I, I almost never observable, right? We have the CH, the, the causal hierarchy theorem here saying that almost never uh, we can use the data to, to, to infer what's the causal, uh, the, the true co the structure causal model here. It, the, the layers never collapse. We cannot use just information from one layer to, to understand a higher layer. 
So in, 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 in the theory, in the causal inference, inference theory, we are moving towards scenarios in which partial knowledge of the SCM is available. That's the causal graph. So the causal graph, it is uh, just a qualitative description of the, the SCM. It's much more easier to get this information than the SCM. And then the causal inference theory helps us to understand whether the inferential target is computable or not. And we, we saw some examples where we could do the cross layer inference moving from layer one, where lives the data, where the data, data lives, to the layer two, uh, where we can do uh, interventional reasoning, right? So we use the G and PV here as input to infer something about the interventional uh, distribution. So this is what the causal inference does from observational data. Uh, I would like to use Fusion now to show you how to uh, do causal identification. Uh, okay, can you see here? I'm sharing the right screen, I guess so. So um, the, the Fusion here has a, a, a library uh, that I would like to show you. So you can create your own projects. Like I have a lot of projects here, uh, just popping up here something. All right, so we have uh, a lot of projects that we can create a lot of projects, but uh, it's already available a lot of uh, examples. So these are examples uh, in Fusion. So these are Fusion examples. We are uh, also implemented some examples in the in, that, that are in the causality book. So if you're uh, studying uh, causal inference and you want to follow the examples using Fusion, you can come here and, and load one of the examples. Also, there is this book, Causal Inference in Statistics is a Prime. It's a, uh, a beginner uh, version of, I, I think it's a good intro, introductory book, book if you want to uh, start to, to, to learn about causal inference. I would start by learning, by, by reading this uh, book here, Causal Inference in Statistics is, a, is by Pro. So all these figures are already here. Uh, also, if you're reading the book of why, all the figures are here. Um, also our papers, so in the causal AI papers, some of the papers have examples and we have implemented, uh, we have implemented there here. So you can play a, a, around here and, and, and learn a lot. So just for identification, let's just uh, load the simplest one. This is the back door. And I can ask here, so this is the summary. So I can say, what's the variable that the treatment variable, what's the outcome variable. Sometimes I want a covariate specific effect, but uh, in this case, I don't want. And here in the bottom, I can uh, ask you, what's the causal effect of the variable X on Y? Uh, I'm not going to condition on anything here. And if I compute here, it, it you gives me exactly the expression of the backdoor adjustment. I can even come here in the derivation and it you show me, first it you tell me that this is just the backdoor adjustment, but it, it you also uh, tell me what's the derivation using the rules of the do calculus that allow me to write the intervention distrib distribution just in, term of, in terms of the observational distribution. So it's, it's very educational. Uh, it's, it, it's a re really nice uh, interface. You can learn a lot by using Fusion. Uh, note here that I could add some bidirected arrows. Suppose that I have a bidirected arrow here. Uh, we know now what's the backdoor adjustment. We just need to block all the confounding paths. In this case, uh, we have to, it's this to uh, the same expression, even if I, I don't have the knowledge to uh, remove the the or to make the assumption that there's no other variable affecting both z and y here however if this was the case right so suppose that this is the case here so i don't have knowledge to uh to say that there is no confounder here and there is also i cannot make the assumption that there is no confounder here if this is the case note here that i the effect is not identifiable. It's a negative instance here. 
So sometimes people say that, oh, if you have just pretreatment variables, so remember, this is the, our requirement of the back to door adjustment. If I have just pretreatment variables, I can adjust for all these covariates and it's okay, I will have the, uh, the causal effect. And this is not true. If you are in this case where we have bidirected error in both sides, the effect is not identifiable. It's not possible to compute. If you're computing using this expression here, you are conditioning on Z, so you are inducing bias because you are opening this path here through the collider. So you are actually inferring a biased, a biased uh, effect. It's not the causal effect. Um, we can load other examples. Um, I, I, let me load here the front door. So this is another one that we just showed. Uh, I just showed you. Uh, if I right, if I click here, you see the front door adjustment, right? Uh, these are classical adjustment uh, formulas. Uh, note here that I could have something. Oh, let me load uh, another one. That's that's nice. It's the napkin one. So this one there's no uh, classical formula, but if you compute here you will see like a, a, a more complicated expression, but it, it is in terms of the observational distribution. So the point here, you can just draw your causal diagram here that's describing your reality, your, uh, the, the, the reality of your, 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 in your study, in your case. So if you know, um, you can encode everything that you know about the underlying system using uh, drawing in, the, in here in the canvas. You can draw the causal diagram. You can just click here in compute and see if your effect will be identifiable or not. Uh, right. Um, again, if I have something like that, I will say that it's not identifiable. So you can play in uh, using different models here to understand if. Maybe I need to add a variable here. Oh, let, let me try to add this variable. So I can go to the environment and maybe measure some, some other variable that you block this path. Now it is identifiable using another expression. So you can play with this uh, app uh, using the variables in your research and then check what, what will be needed to uh, infer the causal effect if you want the effect of X and Y in this case. Um, all right, I guess that's it. Uh, you, can, you can play also with the do calculus here if you are learning. Um, there is this knife here. <laughs> uh, so you can, for example, draw ask what's the causal effect when we remove the arrows, for example, into X. So it shows here when we remove the arrows into X or uh, for the backdoor case, let's go back to the backdoor case here. Like I can ask here after removing the outgoing arrows from X, that's the graph. Now is the X independent of Y given Z? And it's not, right? If I remove this one here, it is now. So you can play, you can learn a lot, you can check in your research if the, uh, how can you compute the causal effect in your case. So it's very useful. Um, okay, uh, going back now. Uh, questions uh, up to this point? Maybe I can take questions now because I just finished the first part of the, about the causal inference from observation studies. Oh, I have it here. Sorry, I forgot. Uh, is the definition of an underlying causal model a one-shot exercise, or can it be considered considered as an iterative process? In words, is it possible to leverage post-fit information to improve our knowledge of the underlying cause? Definitely, yes. Um, we have some. Uh, this is about experimental design. So sometimes you, let's go back here to fusion. Uh, I was trying to show exactly this one here. So we have a paper about experimental design 
uh, I don't remember the name, but check there in the causeoai.net. Uh, that is about, uh, that it's a paper, the title is about experimental design using uh, minimal experiment, um, under the minimal number of experiments. So how, and this is about structured learning, exactly what we are asking here. So what we can do, like we have the data. So the data, we, we try to learn the causal structure from the data and the data give us a, a known, uh, it's, a, it's just the equivalence class, right? It's, it's just a no, uh, it's not completely oriented. The causal graph has some arrows that could not, could not, not be oriented, which means that the data is not enough to uh, recover, uniquely recover the causal diagram. However, we can use uh, experimental data to improve this learning of the causal graph. And th this paper, for example, is telling us exactly what are the experiments that are needed to run. So you need to go to the environment and now do an experiment, but it's not exactly the experiment on the variable X, because if you do the experiment in the variable X, you already know what's the effect of X on Y. But sometimes you are interested um, on uh, recovering the underlying nature, uh, the, the causal diagram that, that describes the underlying nature. You are more interested about understanding the relationship of the variables, or sometimes it's not feasible, it's not possible to uh, conduct an, an, an experiment directly in the variable X. Sometimes you have uh, ethical problems or, um, the variable X is, is not, a, 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 for example, if it's cancer, it, that is a, a huge ethical problem here. How can you do intervention about making someone being uh, having cancer? And it's impossible. So sometimes you have to use some proxy variable to do the, the, the experiment. So in this case, if you the, this, in this paper, we have this work where we, we show you exactly what are the experiments that are needed to recover uh, the, the causal diagram. So in this case here, um, uh, so, yeah, not in this case, but uh, this is for structural learning. Uh, we don't have, this is an open problem right now for inference. So uh, it, it, right now it's a manual process. So you could come here and then see, oh, if I, if I try to measure some variable between Z1, Z2 and Z1, right? I know a, a little bit about the system. So I know some variable that could be in the, in the between, in the, in the between, or I could, I, uh, maybe it's a confounder. So if there's some variable here that could block this path, I could try to, uh, to, to come here in fusion and draw what would happen if this variable was measured and see what would be the, the causal uh, effect. But you asked me about trying to improve your knowledge about the underlying causal model specification that's about learning the causal graph. We exactly did that in one of the papers. So how, what are the experiments that you need to run to recover, uniquely recover the causal structure? It's a very nice paper. Um, all right, uh, so if there's no more question, Perfect. Uh, I would like to go to the second part of this. Uh, the, now it's the third part of the tutorial where I'm going to talk a little bit about the transportability. So this is um, this is the it's it's a task in in the causal fusion causal data fusion uh, uh, side of the theory where we want to. Uh, we want to account for differences in another dimension. So before we were here, so we were talking about the dimension two, right? Dimension two here. And uh, now we are in dimension one. So the other, the other dimensions were fixed here. Now this, in, in this other case here, we are changing the dimension one. So we are talking about collecting data from one population, one domain or one species and then extrapolate or transport the knowledge that we obtained by the data here uh, to another, a different uh, population. So this is also known as external val validity. So transportability is all about extrapolation and robustness of causal claims. And just let me read here uh, what's the problem statement. So the question is, is it possible to compute the effect of X on Y in a target environment 
pi star. So we have a different uh, target in, in environment denoted as pi star. And uh, in this target environment, it's not possible, it's not feasible to run ex experiments. But we have available some experimental data or we could uh, we have experimental findings in another population, in another environment that's called denoted here as pi. And we see here that the answer is yes. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. It's exactly as, as in the inference problem, where if your knowledge is too weak, sometimes you cannot infer but, uh, uh, the effect in the, tar in the target. In, in this case, in, in, the, in the same population here, sometimes even if you have conducted an experiment in the population pi, you cannot use this information to apply or to deploy your system in another population, uh, right? Uh, for example, if you run an experiment in the US, maybe you cannot transport the same results to Portugal, to Brazil, or to uh, any other part of the world without doing this transportability analysis. So, uh, but sometimes, yes, sometimes we have the, we have the knowledge to do this uh, analysis. So our goal is exactly to formalize, to characterize the conditions to when and how this is possible. Uh, I, I like this analogy here where uh, we have the lab. So we have the lab here is just uh, it, it's a, met, a metaphor for any environment, population, domain or setting. And in the lab, we have this causal diagram here describing the lab. And we, actually, the lab is this control environment when, when, uh, where you have access to conduct experiments. So in this case here, you can run an experiment to see the effect of X on Y. But the lab is different from the real world. So how can we move from the lab to the real world? So we want to do this uh, extrapolation here. The dream scenario that's very unrealistic here is that everything is shared. What I mean is that all, all the functions that, uh, so we have the causal diagram here in, in the lab. So we have the functions of X. So F, X here is listening to Z. Uh, the, the W here is listening to X. So all these functions, the F sub, sub Z, the F sub X, all these functions in the lab are exactly the same as the functions in the real world. So everything that you did here in the lab can be directly transportable. Everything is the same, so it's trivially, trivially transportable. This is the dream scenario. I, I believe it's almost never that this happens. Uh, in the other extreme, in, in the other side, we have the, the case where everything is different. So when we have this difference, uh, we denote here, now it's the overlapping. We have the, the causal diagram in the, in the lab. And we also have the causal diagram in the real world, and they can be different. Every time that they are different is because we have to add this yellow arrow here. Uh, this yellow arrow is just denoting here that there are some external factors that, that are uh, inducing some difference in the variable Z, right? So it's a, uh, another source of heterogeneity here that we have just to account for the differences between the source and the target domain. So if your knowledge, like if you, if there is no similarity between the lab and the real world or between the source and the target domain, you have to put a, this yellow arrow here uh, pointing on all variables. This is the nightmare scenario, it's the worst case scenario. And in this case, right, all the functions are different here. Uh, even that the distribution, if, if, if you have differences in the distribution of the variables, also you have to add the yellow arrow pointed to the variable. So if this is the case, then uh, anything is transportable, right? But usually this is not the case. Usually you are performing in a controlled environment, but you know what are the similarities. Like if you are uh, doing some experiments in bonobos, a type of monkey, you know that the monkeys is a, a little bit similar to the humans. Uh, even mice, we now have uh, some, some mice models or, uh, that we, the, the physicians understand what are the, the similarities between these two organisms. Or in the population, sometimes you know that in, uh, in, in the US, for example, you have some 
the, 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 uh, there are some differences between the US or between Portugal, for example, but there are some similarities. It's not actually everything different. And if you understand what are these differences and you account on, this on, on your model, you will be in the spectrum here. So you'll be in the between, right? And you, you won't be in the net nightmare scenario. Probably you won't be in the, 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 the dream scenario, but you'll be here in the between. And then we can do the transportability analysis. So just one example in, this, in the middle of this spectrum. So this is a, a, an example where I can say, so I can assume, so the assumption, so this is my diagram. Uh, this is an ex experiment, for example, that I want to uh, transport. I did, some, I, run, uh, I did some experiments in LA. So I have the causal effect there in LA, but I, I want to move or I want to, to say, use this information to say something about the population in New York City. So our source population is LA, our target population is the New York City, and I want to, I want to transport the effect from LA to New York City. And this is the this is this is called actually selection diagram. It's just the overlapping between the diagram in LA and the diagram in the New York City. So I know that the variable Z, the age. In LA, the distribution of the age in LA is different from the distribution of the age in New York City. If this is the case, I have to put this yellow arrow here in Z. Um, I also, uh, uh, in this case here, I, I, I don't want to commit to say that the, the variable X is, is, not, is the same in LA in, in the New York City. Probably the function of the, the, the way that people are receiving some treatment in LA may be, diff may, may be different from the New York City. So I want to add the yellow arrow as well here, but maybe the, the so the, they are both humans, right? We are talking about humans. So maybe the outcome here, maybe it's a disease or something, you'll be the same in both because we are both humans. So maybe I can commit and say, I can make the assumption of not adding the, the yellow arrow here uh, pointing to Y. So if this is the case, uh, again here, this is just the assumptions that I'm making. The, the functions for Z and X are shared, but the function, sorry, the functions for Z and X are not shared, they are different, but the functions for Y are shared, they are the same. Uh, this is the, given that as input, we need to understand the, the similarities between the target and the source population to create the selection diagram, this is needed. Also, what, what else we have available? We have, for example, in LA, where we run the, we, we had uh, the experiment, we have this experimental data. So we know what's the effect of X on Y, even uh, considering some specific covariate here. And we also have observational data. Suppose that we ha also collected some data from the hospital, like passively collected. In New York City, we couldn't run or we, we don't want to run. Or we want to first try to leverage what's already available. So. But we have available observational study. We went there to the hospital in Columbia, uh, the Columbia Hospital, for example, and we, we went there and we get some data. So we have available just observational data there. So using this information, the, the question is, what's the effect of X on Y in the population P star? So the probability star here is referring to the probability in the population pi star, that's New York City. And the quest, uh, and the, this question can be answered. So this is a positive, a positive instance uh, where the effect in New York City is just the effect in LA. So this part here is in, in LA. Uh, yeah, I have, I have notes here. So yeah, so this probability here is coming from LA. We have available, and this other, this other part here. So we are doing a re rating or a recalibration of this causal effect by summing over the probability of age that's given in New York City. So this is also available. It's coming from the observational data. Uh, so it's possible to transport, but it's not exactly the same. We need to do this recalibration here, right? And this formula is given uh, if you have the causal, the selection diagram. Uh, informing the similarities between the source and the target domains. This transport formula, as we, we usually, usually call it, uh, 
Uh, it's very known in the, in the literature. This is specific, uh, this is specific uh, recalibration here where we are rewriting by the variable that's different. They have, they, it's very known, it's well known, and uh, uh, it's called recalibration. However, the question is, can we use the same recal uh, recalibration formula for every transportability analysis that we are doing? Uh, that's what we are going to see here. Uh, what's the sensitivity of the transport formula, given the causal assumptions that are encoded in the, in the selection diagram? So this is uh, almost the same graph as before. I'm just adding the bidirected arrows here between Z and X and X and Y. Um, in this case, uh, I, I'm adding here that is this uh, unobserved confounder between X and Z, and also this unobserved confounder between X and Y. So this is the only dif uh, difference between the, the, the graph that I just showed before. And in this case, the formula is exactly the same. And why is that? The, 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 the point is that this source of a, a heterogeneity here has to be blocked. We need to use the separation here as before. So I need to block the source of a heterogeneity here that's going to the outcome. So that is this path here from S to Y. So conditioning on Z, we block the source of, of uh, her, uh, heterogeneity. This is the same for X. So we, we are blocking the, the, the path coming from this source of heterogeneity to Y by conditioning on X. When we are talking about the X here, we are conditioning on X. So it's okay, if in, even if we have this bidirected arrows, we are still blocking this path. So the formula is the same. And now suppose that this is the graph. And note here that these two graphs are equivalent. So they are statistically equivalent because they are both compatible with the data. So this is a, these are two graphs that are in the same equivalence class here. So both of them could, be, could generate the same data that we have observed. So without knowing that those two are, uh, that one, without knowing what are the assumptions, I cannot decide if it's this one or, or this one, just using the data. I need to know what's the, the selection diagram. So if this is the case uh, where I have a variable Z, that's just a proxy. So suppose that age was not measured. So Z, suppose that Z here is age. I guess I have here age. Suppose that this variable is age. In this case, age was measured, but in this case, no. I, I, Z means uh, it's just a proxy for age. Suppose that's just language skill. And the, so what's different here is the variable Z. So the source of heterogeneity here is into Z. And in this case, you see here, this is a collider. So conditioning on Z, we are actually opening this path here. So we are inducing more heterogeneity to, in, into Y. So if we use this formula, we are estimating a biased effect. So we cannot blindly use that other formula called the S recalibration that's, that has been used in, in many uh, other fields. We have to understand what are the assumptions behind it. So, and those are encoded in the selection diagram. So once you know that this is the case, we will know that in this case, the, the effect is exactly the same as the one that we observed in the source population. So the effect in LA uh, is the same as the effect in New York. We don't need to recalibrate here because the collider is already blocking this path. So it's no problem. There's no problem about this variable being uh, uh, different in, in, the two, in, the, in the two populations. And we are already conditioning on X here. Uh, now, this is another example where instead of Z being a proxy, Z is a mediator between X and Y. And if this is the case, um, if this is the case, suppose that Z is a, um, a biomarker, for example. Uh, what, what is happening here? The, there is a, a different formula. So it, it's a completely different formula. It's also a, a recalibration. But the recalibration is over uh, the conditional distribution of Z given X that's given in the target population. So it's not just given Z here, it's the conditional distribution. So it's a different formula. So it's sensitive to the causal assumptions. So the lesson is 
causal assumptions are required since data does not impose en enough constraints over the causal structure and the results are structure sensitive. sensitive. Uh, this is just the, the big picture of the decision problem or the transportability analysis. We have a query. A query is the intervention distribution in the population P star. And we have a graph. The graph is a selection diagram that's the overlapping causal structure between, uh, is the overlapping between the causal structure in the source and the target domain. So we have these yellow arrows here and we have data available. The data could be experimental data in, in the source domain. We could have observational data. We have like a, an arbitrary combination of experimental and uh, observational data. And based on the current knowledge about the problem that's included here in the graph, in the selection diagram in two, and the available data sets three, how can we answer, uh, uh, the, 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 how can we infer the uh, interventional distribution in the target domain? So we use this transportability engine and we get the solution. Every time that we have an, an yes, we will have the transportability formula. And if it's no, um, yeah, and we, when, when it's no, we have to improve our knowledge about the system. Uh, observational data in the target map plus experimental data in the source. Here, that's the source that the, the, the data that we have available. So this is just a saying that the expression depends only on the experiment on the data that we have available. And in this, in this case, we can compute the, tar, uh, the, the causal effect in the target domain. So this is the flow that we have in the transportability theory. Uh, we have been studying now uh, the cases where we are dealing with the no instances as well for both for causal inference and transportability theory. Um, every time that we have a no answer, we could go over uh, bounding. So this is what we have been working right now. So how can we instead of giving you the point estimate of the causal effect, maybe I can give you the interval, the confidence interval where this, uh, uh, where the, the, the causal effect, effect uh, where that includes the causal effect. Uh, sometimes this is a very large uh, interval and then it's not, um, it, it does not say much about the causal effect, but sometimes it helps. So we are now, trying these approximate inferences in the cases where it's not, it's not possible to do point, point, uh, point that we don't have point identifiability. Uh, this result here, uh, so this is the first result that we have. This is a synthetic characterization of transportability. And it's uh, the, the theory that we have now, it's sound and complete, which means that given the, uh, uh, so we have like a do calculus reduction. It's, it's the same. We are using the same do, do calculus to reduce the expression, uh, the, 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 intervention, the, the intervention distribution. That's our query, the quantity Q here. We are trying to, we, we, we try a, a, a derivation using do calculus to reduce this, this quantity here to an expression that's, uh, that depends only on the distributions available. And it's sound and complete. It's an if and only if uh, condition here. So if you, we cannot have this uh, this derivation, is because your uh, your knowledge, your current knowledge about the, the the underlying systems. Now it's the source and target domain. It's uh, it's too weak. It's it's not enough. Uh, just an example here. This is suppose that this is the causal graph here. Then. In this case, I have this derivation. You see here that the, 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 the probability in pi star, right? It's just, we can write this distribution just in terms of the probability in the source domain and the observational distribution in, in the pi star. That's the pi star here. Now, oops, so just observe here the difference between the, the causal graph. So this is the original one that's, that the effect is transportable. Now suppose that we have we haven't measured the variable w here. So what we have right now is it, described by this causal diagram. We don't have the variable w here. If this is the case, then it's not transportable, right? 
So what what this means? This means that if we have two, I, I won't go uh, I won't go over these models, but we can construct two different models that are both compact compatible with the causal diagram. They are also compatible with all the distributions that we have available, all the observational distributions in the source and in the target domain, also the experimental distribution in the, the source domain. And even that, despite of all, all this uh, shared, uh, all the shared information, they have different intervention distributions. So we cannot transport the effect. Uh, the meaning is very similar to the uh, to the one in the causal inference. So we are talking here about the intersection between the models that are compatible with the causal diagram and the models that are compatible now with all the data that we have available. And in this case, uh, we have in the intersection all models in the intersection they 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 agree with the, the same interventional distribution. So we regardless of what's their true uh, causal model, we can infer what's the interventional distribution. Uh, formally, we have two different, um, two di di different models and they, are sh they, they agree with everything that we are giving as input. And then uh, despite of all that, and, and, and then in, as a result, we also have the same interventional distribution. So this is the case, it's a positive case of transportability. Uh, that is also the other case where it's not transportable. And the meaning is that in the intersection, we have some, some models that are, that are as likely as the other. So all this, the models in the intersection here, they are equally, uh, they, they equally describe all the, the input that we are giving here, the, the causal diagram, the distributions, everything is compatible, but they have different interventional distributions. And um, so these are very small examples. That's why uh, in, in reality, we don't, we can't try to do the derivation using those two calculus by hand. So that's why our second result is an algorithm to decide what's the effect, if the effect is transportable or not. So this is a, a much more complicated graph. If you try to do the derivation by hand, you'll be a nightmare. So we need an algorithm. And the algorithm you take as input just the selection diagram, right? And then you uh, you give you as output the answer if it's transportable or not. If it, it, yes, then it, it you give me the transport formula. That depends only on the measures that are available in the in the source domain and the measures that are available in the target domain. This is the expression in this case. So we see here that the, the the, the causal effect in the target domain is expressed as just using the information that we have available. So observational data, no, sorry, this is experimental data in the source domain, also experimental data in the source domain, and we have ex, uh, observational data in the target domain here and here. So we are compounding all the available distributions to uh, infer the, the, the target query in the target domain. So this is uh, a positive case and we have algorithms to do that. This is really helpful. Like this is what we have in reality. So this is a, uh, one of the applications we've, we've, we, we are uh, currently working on. It's about uh, a, a disease in the lungs. So we have all these factors, all these phenotypes. Uh, we have genotypes as well. How can we uh, how can we compute the effect here of a, a drug on the, the on the survival of the, the patient by considering this very complex uh, causal diagram? We need uh, an automated transportability analysis for these large scale settings. Uh, in causal fusion, we have as well the transportability analysis. Uh, this is uh, I, I think I cannot go there, but uh, there is no time. But this uh, can be done there. I can add this. These are the yellow arrows here. So every time that we have a difference in the in the variable, we we add this transportability node, and then we can ask what's the effect of x on y. Now we add here all the populations that we have available, all, all the data that we have available. So I'm see, I'm saying here that we have in the p star. So this is the target domain. We have observational data in the, the target domain. We also have observational data in the source domain, 
And this is the notation uh, where we have an interventional max here. So also we have the experimental data in the, uh, in the, the source domain. So using, so this query here, that's the effect of X on Y in the target domain can be computed from these available distributions using this formula. This is the recalibration formula. These are exactly the examples that I just showed in the previous slide. Uh, and the fusion, you give you the, 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 corrective, the corrective formula. So this is the recalibration formula. If this is the case, this is the case of the proxy, right? And this is the case that we just need to copy the causal effect from the source is the same as the causal effect in the target domain. And this is the other case where the high calibration is over uh, a different type of weight here. It's the conditional effect, the conditional uh, probability of Z given X. So everything that we can uh, do with transportability analysis is there in fusion, it's implemented in fusion and you can play with it. Um, uh, before concluding this transportability part, uh, I would like to, to make a, a note here because many people believe that randomized control trials or, or controlled experiments are the gold, the gold standard in causal inference. Um, but what about generalizability from trials? So we have a trial and the trial is it's awesome at having internal, internal validity about having causal effects in the population where the, 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 the experiment has been conducted. But what about transporting the, 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 the causal claims, right? If we have an experiment in the US, can we use the same result to something in Brazil, in Portugal? We have a lot of going on here uh, with trials and then we want to use the same information. Can we actually use the same information? And this is the simplest example that shows that this is not the case. Uh, suppose that this is the diagram before randomization. So before the trial in the source population, this is the causal diagram uh, describing the reality. So we have confounding between everything here, right? We, we have just three variables, but we believe that there are many other variables affecting X and Y and Z here. So this is the scenario uh, under just three variables. If we do the random, randomization, we actually remove all the incoming errors from into X. The, those are the confounding uh, on, the, on the, the treatment variable here. So this is true, but we have this ar yellow arrow. So the yellow arrow means that in the source domain, the variable Z are different from the variable Z in the target domain. So I can't compute the effect of X on Y on the population where we just run the experiment. But I cannot, in this case here, know that if I have this yellow arrow here, I cannot block the source of heterogeneity here into Y because I have this path here that I need to condition on Z to block this path here. But if I condition on Z, I'm opening this collider. So there is no way of removing the source of heterogeneity here. So there is no way of transporting the effect that we just got in this experiment to the target population. So the lesson here is that is even if we have a perfect RCT, a perfect experiment, we still need to do this transportability exercise to transport the effect to another population. We cannot just uh, avoid or ignore the transportability theory. Um, Right. Um, before going over our lab, uh, I would like to take some questions up to this point. Um, is there any question here? Um, no. All right. So, no questions. Okay. Uh, so, just a few minutes here, just to explain a little bit about the Causeway I lab. Uh, how many how many minutes I have left? It's just I am not sure. Okay, I, I will try to conclude here. It's it's, it's really fast. Uh, uh, the do, you, do, do you plan to do another break or no? Maybe not. Right. I I think at least here in in my time I I'm already done. Is is that true? We have we have a little time more. Maybe one hour or something or maybe less if you want. 
Wow, I think I just okay. So yeah, yeah if maybe you want we... to finish earlier, it's fine. It's just that we, if you want more time, we would have it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, all right, maybe to finish uh... early, it's okay as well. All right, so I have like one hour left. Maybe. If... All right. <laughs> Uh, okay, we can try to take questions. I guess, I guess right now about up, up to this point before. Or maybe take a break. Maybe I can take a break and then. Okay, so uh, we see you in fifteen minutes again. Or I, I have like more fifteen minutes at most. Okay, so maybe then a shorter. Then it might not make sense to make fifteen minute pause for fifteen minutes. As you prefer, we could you could finish this if you want right now, or make a small pause and maybe five minutes and continue with those final fifteen minutes, as as you prefer. Okay, let, let me finish. So uh, maybe we leave you earlier, yeah, and then sure. I can. And then questions. we can have some final questions. There, there's actually one question now. If you want yeah, to uh, yeah, okay. This. I take this question. Uh, Thank you. Um, could you illustrate how CI, how causal inference can play a role uh, in NLP, right? Um, so every time, let I, I guess I can go to that slide. This one. So this is the challenge that I I, I, uh, I I brought here in the beginning of the tutorial. Um, all right. So how can we add this layer in the NLP tools? So everything that I said here, the, the, the theory is general in the sense of I don't need to understand what type of data I have here, but I need to include a layer to do some causal inference. Causal inference is, um, it is needed every time that you want to, to do generalizability. So if you are talking about different populations, so sometimes if you are, um, if you are collecting data from one population and you want to, to transport the, the, the conclusions from another population, and, and when I say population, it's actually any domain. Um, I, I'm not an expert in NLP, but I believe, for example, if you have a very specific context, like if your, your data is very specific on a certain domain, you are talking about classics in literature, or you are talking about poems, I, I, I don't know, like you're, you're, you have a very specific type of literature that you are uh, analyzing or processing, and you want to transport this to another type of domain. Now, uh, or maybe different aids, different eras uh, of literature. Or if you are in Twitter, maybe you want to transport the Twitter in, in, in that the, from, from tweets in, in the US, you want to understand how this can be transportable to another tweet, to, to the context in, in Portugal or in another place in Europe. Uh, so if you need to, to generalize knowledge, this is part of the cause of data science. This is not something that you can do just using machine learning. You need to do transportability. So this is one point. So generalizable knowledge. Another point is decision-making. So sometimes you want to understand what's the effect of an intervention. And when I say intervention, is the effect of making a change. So suppose you are in Amazon, uh, uh, like any, any uh, web website that, that's selling products. This is the, I think this is actually the, the experiment that I gave here. Um, that I gave here. So if you want to do decision-making, right? And this is the scenario, you, you are reading the rating uh, this product ratings from the website you want to do and you you want to understand what's the effect of having this rating on the sales on the on the sales performance uh, like is really a product with just one star uh, less can, can I change the performance of this product of of, uh, of, uh, of uh, can I sell a product? more than the, the, if I just change the rating of, the, of this product. 
if it's the same product, everything is the same, the context is the same. I want to know what's the effect of changing the, the star of from five stars to one stars. I will decrease the performance of the sale uh, of selling selling this product. I want to see this effect. So this is a decision making. I don't want to just to see what's the uh, I don't want to do prediction. Prediction you 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 you, you just uh, compute the probability of observing a ver uh, a product that has a high rating. That probably he will uh, uh, he will sell uh, much more than the other that has just one star, but is this due to some confounding, or it's actually due to the rating? And uh, this is very good to re recommend our systems. Like, uh, what's the effect of showing some uh, advertising or some so, uh, showing some propaganda, something like? What's the effect on on making the person uh, watch it, watch a movie or buying some product. Uh, what's the real effect? If I just change, if I instead of showing this advertise, I just show another. What's the effect? What's the causal effect? So those are decision making, and you need to to go over causal inference. And going back here, how can this be incorporated in the in the, in the nature language process? We need to add this layer. So we need to incorporate the causal diagram. We need to do this causal inference to, um, to get what, what are the expressions to compute the causal effect, given that this, the, the, the assumptions encoded in the causal diagram to actually do some, do some decision. What's the best decision, right? How can, how can we all optimize uh, some advertising? How can I optimize... Uh, even generation of new text. How can it, here in the in the medical field can I use can I can I infer some causal effect just using this data that I I, I have here from abstracts or for, from from full full papers? How can I, I, I extract that? But I have causal claims without confounding, and in the target domain doing like general generalizable knowledge. So you can actually improve a lot any type of um, tool that you have here in the video by adding these components from causal inference. Uh, did I answer your question? Uh, I think this is still in, in, in the early developments of the neural neuro, uh, language processing. So maybe you be the one adding this layer or creating this new generation of algorithms that can uh, extract the causal knowledge from textual data. Uh, we are open to collaborations. We are very, very interested in, in, in applications of the causal inference in, in NLP, in health sciences, in business, in, in economics. We have a huge group in the causal AI lab. So if you are interested in, in developing these methods, we are open to discuss more, to talk, to collaborate. It just, uh, uh, just send us an, an email. We will be very happy to help you. Uh, and so thank you for that. I hope I answer your question. All right. Uh, the next question is, how do you go about determining what, what the confounding factors might be and whether you are considering a large enough number of confounding factors when trying to move from a population to another? Um, I think your, your question here about the, the variables that we have available. So you have to draw the causal diagram. Every time that you are ignoring some variables, suppose that you have 1 billion variables in your data set. We have now this very uh, big data. And you want to select or do this feature selection of what are the variables that we have available. We can use, uh, in applications, usually we use prior knowledge, domain knowledge to select those that are important. Uh, there's, I, I don't know any, research that does this automatically, but you could try to draw the causal di diagrams using all the variables, but I think this would be very expensive computationally. So I, I, I'm not sure, I guess it, this, is, this would be a, a very interesting line of research, but you can try to select using your knowledge, what are the variables that are important. And every time that you are ignoring some variable, if this variable is a confounding, you have to add the bidirected arrow. And there is no problem about adding the bidirected arrow, as I said here. 
sometimes with those even with those uncertainties in this uh in, in the description of the the reality we can do causal inference so you can select those variables draw the causal diagram that's that's related just to these variables and see if your effect is transportable or you're talking about transportability so uh, if your effect is transportable or not uh for causal inference is the same uh, there there's just not i i haven't seen any uh, paper or research about doing this you know automatically this this, this uh doing this automatically uh but you you need to draw the causal diagram until you get the, the answer right uh i guess there's another Okay, I think I answer all the questions. Uh, again, I'm very happy to take more discussions offline uh, by email, or we can even try to meet to meet and start uh, another conversation. I, I will be very happy to help you in in your field, even if it's in an NLP or in other field. All right. Um, so should I continue, or we do some? Uh, is there a raise uh, hand? I think there's a raise hand by an attendee. How many? There's one raise hand. If I'm not oh, mistaken. where? Sorry, I I'm not Lucy seeing this. Lucy Havens. Yeah, thank you. I so I just want to kind of make sure I'm following correctly. So, as kind of an example that I'm thinking, maybe this transportability theory could be applied in. My own research, I'm looking at gender bias in the language of archival catalogs. So the language that's used to describe different items there. And one of the things that I'd like to consider is how generalizable this might be to other cultural heritage institutions. So like a library or a museum, kind of all based within, uh, within the UK, because that's where I'm doing my research. So is that something where like I could draw this sort of diagram to try to estimate how well I might be able to apply a model that can classify different types of gender bias in archives to a library or a museum? All right, let's see if I understood your question. Uh, so you, you have data. Uh, okay, what are the two populations where, what's the source population in your target population? You have, you're, you're talking about transporting from yeah, so it would be so the archive? archives would be the source. That's, yeah, like a language source of all these descriptions right. of different archival items. And then the target could be like a museum catalog that also has descriptions of different items in the museum. Okay, yeah, I think this is a, this is a question that requires knowledge, right? Domain knowledge. What are the, yeah. the, the, the key is understand, we have to understand the similarities not the difference, it's the similarities, because okay. all the assumptions are about removing that yellow arrows into the variable. So every time that you cannot make the assumption, even if it's if they are the same, you can add the arrow there. Like it's not a problem. You are just making uh, weaker your assumptions. Your assumptions is about removing the yellow arrow. So what are the similarities between the, the texts that, that are coming from archive with the texts that you can find in these museums? Uh, I think this is a, a very important question that I cannot answer. It's not my field, but uh, if if you are in that in that stream scenario, if you're in that in the, the the other side of the 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 spectrum, remember where everything you don't know anything about the similarities between the the the, choose, the source of the target domain. Anything is transportable, but I, I guess if you are doing this, uh, if 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 you are collecting data from the archive to do this inference in the museums, probably you know what are the similarities, why you can use this data to, to say something about the, the collections in the, in the museums. So you can start by using these variables, right? You can draw the causal diagram just using the variables that you know that they are, they are shared, they are the same. And then you can start by adding the other variables that you don't understand very well, but then those you'll be uh, with this yellow arrow, right? and see if the effect is transportable or not. I would start with that. 
Okay, cool. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, I, I two questions. Would it make sense to use causal analysis of neural network weights modules to determine which parts are causally influencing the final result of the network on a given task? For example, say we observe an improvement in a certain metric after adding a new layer, but you are not sure if it was because of the change in the architecture of the other. Um, so you are saying that you are changing the weights. I, I think this is more related to, to optimization, right? Yeah, I can just try to clarify, like say, now I'm just thinking if would these tools would be able, uh, like useful in say experimental settings where we are trying different say architectures for neural networks and we are optimizing the, the architectures and say testing them, but then to determine which say um, parts of this change are actually driving the, the improvement. Um, it's just like sort of an open question if it's makes sense right. or if it would be sensible to do so i i i think the the estimation of the weights in the in the deep learning uh in deep learning is usually about an, an optimiz about optimizing some function so i'm not seeing exactly there how how can we add the, the causal layer uh, because you already have the uh, the optimal function if the optimal function is a, a causal quantity uh then maybe you can you can you can drive the, the the optimization to to go uh in a direction that's going through that that's following the expression the, in the causal inference that the the, the 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 that give you the causal effect um so i i don't i i, I cannot answer because I, i'm not an expert in this in, in this field but i can say that we have uh, so it's our, it's not published yet, but it, it is in archive right now. That is this paper by uh, Baron Boeing, Professor Baron Boeing, uh, also with the um, oh uh, yeah. So there's there's this it, it, it is there in the causalai.net.net uh, website. It's in archive as well. But that is the connection between how can we do causal inference using deep learning. But this is more about how can we estimate this, the, the probabilities that we have in the formula, right? The formula, it's a composition of all these probabilities, all these observational probabilities that we have available. So to estimate the, the, the probabilities, we can use the deep learning uh, to do this in a, uh, uh, no, in a non parametric way, uh, using all the, uh, all, all, all the potential of the new, new neural networks. But not about the optimization. It's different, so I, I cannot answer. I, I don't know how to answer your question. All right. Uh, do you know how ex do you know examples where causal inference has been applied in industry to replace A/B testing to decide if deploying some feature you increase some reward? Yeah, this is uh, definitely about reinforcement learning. We have a lot of uh, collaboration with uh, uh, Amazon, uh, Facebook, JP Morgan. We have a lot, a lot of collaborations with the industry where they are using causal reinforcement learning to replace the A-B testing because we are trying to minimize the number of experiments. So every iteration in, re in reinforcement learning is a new test. Is a You need to involve another another person so you, it's hurting it's not good to use uh, we want to minimize the number of experiments and by using by leveraging the causal diagram we showed and uh, and also it's related to boundings how how can we use observational data that we have available and extract some boundings of the causal effect and also using some description of the of, of the system that could be the simplest one. If you don't have anything about any knowledge about the system, you can just use the, the, the ball graph that's the X pointing to Y and then the bidirected arrow between X and Y. This is the, the one that 
doesn't inform anything, it's not informative, but at least we can leverage our observational data uh, to optimize or to accelerate the, the learning in, in, in the, in the online learning, right? The, the, this would be a, a way of minimizing the, the number of experiments. So uh, again, that is this website. It's the CRL, causal reinforcement learning, crl.causalai.net. We have a, a, a three hour tutorial there explaining what's the causal reinforcement learning there. All, it's, it's also with all the papers that we have been published, there are a lot of resources there. And if you're interested, again, you can contact us and we talk more about that. So when my, my, my question was also because, you know, in, in some of these settings, I guess you might end up with very large causal diagrams or, or you might not know exactly how to draw your diagram. Uh, is there any work that copes with uncertainty on the causal diagram or tries to bounce, kind of uh, like what is the problem if, uh, you know, the how much model mismatch is a problem if you are drawing the, the wrong causal diagram? Uh, you know, uh, uh, what is the impact that this can have in your conclusions? Uh, is, is, is this an active uh, area of research as well? Um, I don't know if you understood your question. You're saying that if, if, you're have, if you don't have much knowledge about the systems, right? So you have a weak model and then you want to to and you still want to 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 use causal inference there um it, maybe so, so if if your if your model is very very weak as i said the, the bow graph this is the one that have x and y and a confounding between x and y if it, this is the case it's basically you are not using the causal diagram um so the answer will be no but anything that you know a little bit more than that maybe your effect is identifiable. You, the uncertainty is not the problem. Sometimes even under the uncertainty, you can compute the causal effect. Uh, you have to see in your example, if this is the case. Uh, uh, for example, the backdoor adjustment, as I said, basically you are combining all the variables in, one, in only one cluster. All the set Z is just one cluster. So you have the cluster Z and the treatment X and the, treat and the outcome Y. Basically you are reducing your whole system using just three clusters, three variables in a cluster, two variables in a cluster. And then you are assuming that this, uh, the, the set Z is blocking all the backdoor paths, all the confounding paths. Uh, this is, people are doing a, a lot in the applications, assuming that this is the, the true causal diagram. I, I really don't recommend you to do this. It's, it's kind of a blind way of assuming a model. If you know anything more than this, that, that, that could, be, could move you from the backdoor case to another case, uh, suppose that you have that, remember the, the, the one that I have by directed arrow between X and Z and between Z and Y. This is the, if this is the case, the backdoor, case, the backdoor scenario, you, you, you are not in the backdoor scenario. The backdoor adjustment doesn't work. So if you have anything about that, that, if you have any information that help you to improve your model, you should use uh, any method that you are using that does not, that are not assuming a model behind it. Uh, believe, believe me, they, they are not doing causal inference. Uh, they, they, they are blindly saying that you are doing causal inference, but there are very strong assumptions behind it. And if the assumptions are not, being satisfied if you, if, you are, if you are violating the assumptions you are computing something else it's not the causal effect right so uh, you you have to go through this modeling process um if you don't have access to the causal graph i guess do have recommendations on best approach to build this entanglement based on do actions and observations. Yes, there is a, a paper by Jaber. So look at the causalai.net. That is there uh, a structure learning algorithm that uses data and also uh, observational data and also experimental data to learn the causal graph and also to uh, do causal inference based on, on this graph. So you don't need to, to have the causal 
diagram. You just need to have the equivalence class representing all the possible causal diagrams that are compatible with your data. And sometimes you can do the, the, the inference of your causal uh, effect just based on the equivalence class. Uh, so look at this paper by Jabber. Uh, I mean, Jabber, he's doing causal inference just based on, yes, uh, from, yes, exactly this one. Yes, this is the causal discovery. Causal discovery is the causal structure learning algorithm. I, I guess that is another one that's a causal effect from under Markov equivalence. So the equivalence class is called Markov equivalence class uh, when you are not using any other background knowledge. So there is this paper uh, also by Jabber, I guess, uh, where we can do causal inference using the graph that is discovered just from data. In this case, it's using soft interventions as well. So you, you can do that. Uh, we are working right now on relaxations of, of the causal diagram. So how can we do causal inference? So this is exactly my line of research. How can we do causal inference, relaxing the causal diagram, but using some prior knowledge? So sometimes you know about the ordering of the variables. Someone asked me here, oh, can we use uh, the fact that one, this is a time series data. Can you use the fact that one, coming, one variable is coming before the other or we know that age is affecting the treatment. It's not the other way around. Like you, it's not possible. The treatment is affecting age here. So sometimes you have this knowledge. So how can we incorporate this knowledge and do the causal inference without the graph, just using this knowledge? So we, we internally, we are learning just what's needed and then incorporating uh, in adaptive way uh, all the information that we have available in a way to just return one specific causal effect. So if you are just interested in one specific cause effect, sometimes, but this is our ongoing research. Hopefully soon you have this paper. Um, uh, but yeah, in, in this case, we have to go through data to, to learn more about the causal structure. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, let me... Or, or do you prefer a break? I, I am not sure here. I can finish and then we can leave further. Yeah, I think that, that, that sounds fine. We can we have the closing remarks afterwards. So All right. we can um, even make a break in the middle if, if there's enough time. So it's just a few slides just to explain what we've been working on the lab. Uh, so a big picture here. So. We use the structure causal model. So the structure causal model actually underpins all the methods that we've been developing causal inference. So this is our DNA. That's why we, we have this DNA here. Everything is coming from the structure causal model. Uh, we have this line of research that's about explainability. Uh, how can we explain or how can we have a better understanding of the system? So this is important. Uh, for effect identification and, and and how can you decompose the effect? Sometimes you are in, uh, interested in the direct effect or the indirect effect mediated mediated by some other variable. Uh, this is this is uh, very useful when you are doing fairness when you are doing fairness analysis. So what's the effect? Uh, am I am I being fair here in this decision? Am I really? Uh, for example, sex, uh, gender, or, or age, or some 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 race, some variables that are are concerning here. What's the really what's the effect of this variable in the outcome, right? So all this fair analysis is uh, depends on the decomposition of the causal effects. Uh, also, by an, an analysis, how to improve robustness and generalizability. So everything here is in in this. In, in the side of the uh, our work, where we are going towards a more explainable and uh, more robust and generalizable methods, right? In the side here, we also are, we are also working on this other side where we don't care much about understanding the underlying model, but we would like to make a robust and optimal decision. So for decision making, we are combining reinforcement learning with causal inference. So this is the, 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 that's what I said here, the causal reinforcement learning 
www.causeoai.net, crl.causeoai.net. This website, we have a lot of resources there showing our, uh, our developments in this new, uh, this exciting and, and, and new uh, line of research that's called causal reinforcement learning. Uh, also, uh, how can we optimize randomized cl clinical trials? So, so what are the, the real needed uh, what are the needed experiments to run just to compute one specific causal effect, especially when we, we cannot uh, do an intervention on a specific, on the variable that we are interested in. On. So if we want the effect on X, on Y, can we use uh, interventions? Can we do experiments by intervening on other variables, on auxiliary variables to, to learn more about the effect of X on Y? So how can we uh, design uh, these experiments. This is another learn uh, way of uh, uh, another line of research. And how how should we personalize decision making? So this is usually this is using counterfactual analysis. So how can we we do a more individual? Uh, it's not actually individual because it's always you you are clustering the, those individuals that have similar uh, characteristics or features. But how can we go closer to an individual? And this involves to uh, optimize some counterfactual quantity. Uh, also, we have counterfactual reinforcement learning. So there are, there are a few uh, methods that we are developing here in this side, where we are sometimes we have we are able to run experiments. So we we have access to the environment. So this is not it's not using observational data. It's usually, usually we, you can have an online approach to to run experiments or to do reinforcement learning but to make some decisions. And obvious that is an interaction here between explainability uh, and having the, the, the description of the underlying system. And this is helping to do decision-making as, as well if, if we do how, we do know how uh, optimize these decisions, you help us to understand more about the, the system. So it, it, it's uh, involving, it's a, uh, uh, it's a, 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 a there's a feedback a feedback here one one is helping the other. We are, are we are also interested in applications education and development of software as we showed here in the in the infusion causal fusion. So uh, we are trying to develop most of the algorithms there in fusion, um, but we want to do this in a in a very principal way. So everything is based on on a, on the the causal inference theory. Uh, we, we are writing some chapter book chapters also to, to help you uh, to learn more about causal inference. Uh, applications, we, we have a lot of applications going on. Uh, I am in the side of the health sciences, so I have very exciting, uh, I, I have a very exciting research where we are trying to apply the causal inference in, in the medical field. So if you are interested here, we are also interested, so please. Uh, come talk to us. And what I discussed today here is the side of data science. So uh, how can we combine these multiple data sets? So we have data that are that's mess in, that's messy in, in several dimensions. And people uh, so right now people so uh, a few years back, people were working very specific scenarios by, constraining uh, the, by, 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 by using very strong assumptions. We are trying to open up this, the, uh, this view in, in, towards a more realistic scenario where everything is messing in, in, in many dimensions. So uh, we are converging to very, very general uh, methods, uh, very general work where we can combine and do the data, data fusion to, to extract causal knowledge. Um, so to conclude here, uh, causal data science, we see causal data science as a, a, a collection of methods that allow us to combine data in a principal way, combine data with substantive, substantive knowledge about the phenomena under investigation. So we need, we know that there's the, the PCA, the, 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 the causal hierarchy theory, that's the uh, theorem that says that we need information about the, the underlying system to do causal inference. So causal data science is this, 
it's providing these methods to combine both data coming from heter heterogeneous studies, observational, experimental studies, with this knowledge that we have available. So we, want, we don't want to throw away all this domain knowledge that we have available in, in, the, in the medical field. We have all these physicians that are working a lot, uh, for a long time in, in a specific uh, disease or in some specific uh, treatment. And we want to leverage that. We cannot throw away everything that's known, that's uh, the, all the scientific knowledge that's already available. So we are combining everything to generate causal explanations and better decision-making. Uh, the challenge that we, we discussed here is exactly that not all data is created equal. So most of these modern data, data collections are messy and plagued with systematic bias that need to be understood and controlled so that causal claims can be made. We cannot ignore there, that we have to uh, go through all these dimensions, all these causal data fusion dimensions to uh, to patronize or to, to standardize this data in a way to extract causal knowledge. And for those that are here that are enthusiastic about uh, natural language processing, uh, I see that as a, a new discipline that's emerging. Uh, and this will be indispensable for the development of the next generation of AI. So if you want to extract knowledge from text-based uh, data, from textual data, and you want to do, uh, and, and you want to, to, to have more robust and explain, explainable decision-making, you have to incorporate this causal layer in your tools, right? You, you need to, to go over all this causal inference and transportability analysis if you really want to do decision-making, if you want to do the effect of information, and if you want to generate a, a, a generalizable uh, knowledge. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is my email, so please uh, send me a message if you want to discuss more, if you have uh, some interest ideas to, to, to the research. Uh, I'm copying again here all the resources that I talked during the, 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 the tutorial, the causalfusion.net, our website uh, with a lot of papers and, uh, uh, and other research resources, and also the causal reinforcement learning website, the CRL, causalai.net, uh, if you are interested in, in this topic. Uh, okay, I can take more questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, Thank you, too. Could you please recommend some references on structural learning? Um, this is a huge, there's a huge literature. A lot of people are working on this right now. Uh, if you are starting, I really recommend you that you write here uh, to start looking at the FCI algorithm. Actually, oops, I answered the question, so I went to the other tab here. So the FCI algorithm is the one that's based in a condition independence test. So it's a constraint-based algorithm. Uh, it, 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 does not, it doesn't scale, scale well for high dimensional uh, settings, but it, at least it, it does not rely on the assumption that you have observed all the variables that are needed. This is a very strong assumption that the PC algorithm, for example, does. And, uh, and also most of the score-based algorithms that, are, that scale a bit more, that, that scale better in high dimensional settings, but they, they do this assumption about that's called causal sufficiency. So I, I wouldn't try this one first. I would try the, any, the, any extension of the FCI algorithm. So we have this RFCI, RFCI. FCI is fast causal inference. So we have this RFCI that's real fast causal inference. They try to, to be a bit faster in sparse scenarios. Um, so I, I would start with uh, this one. And there are extensions to time series to uh, sometimes you have uh, mixed data types like with Gaussian, with non-Gaussian, so discrete variables. So, there are a lot of extensions out there. Uh, I, I just would be concerned about this assumption that's called causal sufficiency. That's too strong and people usually don't like it. 
because it, it's assuming that you have observed everything. So you don't estimate where it's possible to have the bidirected arrows. And if this is the case, you don't need causal inference, basically, because if you don't have bidirected arrows, you can just do regression. It's actually exactly the same. But the point is, when we don't, when we have uncertainty about the the the, the system, right? You, you you usually don't measure all the variables. So I, I would try any variation of the FCI outward first. Um, Is there any question? I don't know if I answered this one. This question has been answered live. Yeah, I think I answer all the questions. If I'm, I'm oh, there's yeah. the chat here. I think it's mostly positive feedback. All but right. Check, Thank check, you. have double check to see if there's a missing question. I think I answered all of them. So thank you again, everyone. Uh, it was really uh, a pleasure to be here. I think we we connected very well. I, I hope so. And again, if you have any questions and want to discuss, we will be very happy to uh, to discuss more offline. Thank you. Thank you very thank much you. for the very nice tutorial, Adele. Thank uh, you. And and I think it's that's it. Uh, so you know we are almost. Uh, ending the summer school. Uh, we are just going to have a closing session. I don't know if you are already ready to present it or if you should, we could, should do a uh, short we break. Could, no, we could. We could also do like maybe a five minute break or maybe maybe we can go directly. What do you think, Fernando? Should we? I can proceed. That's yeah, okay. We can, we, can, we can proceed. It's like five okay. minutes. So, so then, uh, Adel, if you want to stay, it says, and then in any case, yeah, thank I'll you stay. for your time. And, um, Okay, so then I'll, let me see. I'll... See if, um... let me share the screen. Okay. Opa. Can you see the presentation moving very fast, backwards? Can you hear me well? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. So, uh, these are the closing remarks. This is something that we do every year. It's, it's uh, mostly um, gathered up by Fernando and Bruno. Um, so I'm here representing the entirety of the organizers. Um, and what we do is we do this, this feedback form and we try to gather all the information for you um, to have a view of the school um, just as it finishes, right? Um, so as many other years, we have people from all around the world I think there's more people from Portugal this year than, than other years, but it's normally like a large number. Um, it's also very Europe-centric, uh, but we also have people from, from far places. Um, this year, we had a record number of applications. Normally, it's pretty high, and it has been increasing linearly. Um, but we this year, we had 700 plus, almost 800 applications, uh, which uh, has us very proud, of course, but it also means uh, a lot of work reviewing applications, right? At the end, we end up accepting plus people that couldn't come. There's 245 students, uh, which is a very small number compared to the number of applications, right? So you should think that in a sense, you, you belong to a small set of, of privileged students that, that managed to attend the school. Also, one thing that, that we're very happy about is that the number of uh, female attendees has been increasing steadily. I think last year was a very good year. This year was also a very good year. We're, we're at 40%. And I think, that, I think that the real objective is 50%. And I think we will manage to achieve this at some point. Uh, we also always keep checks on industry versus academia. And uh, we normally accept a small amount of people from, from the industry. This year it was 11%. Maybe that has to be a bit up. Um, but but in, it's more or less in line with, with other years. So this is a, a map of uh, all the countries that participated as students in LXMLS. Um, as you see, it's very well spread around. Um, so there was a number of remarks. This is a summary of, of some of the more important points. I think that there is always this uh, relation between the lectures and, and the code, right? And, and uh, the guide. And I think that there's always a space for improvements there. Um, we have some concrete ideas, um, but uh, but in general, I think that that it 
the connection kind of work. There's always the discussion about different topics. This is a, a constant every year. Uh, this school is basically centered around NLP, right? And machine learning for NLP. Um, but we, we, we tend to touch particularly in the practical talk, uh, talks other other topics, right? Um, but this is mostly an NLP school. So it will probably remain that, in that direction. Maybe we can open up a bit. Uh, like these two years have been a bit crazy in a sense for us. It, it's, it's odd to, to do this remotely, um, but it has worked. Uh, the virtual event format has been working. There's, there's new things. Maybe we haven't been able to exploit all the things that we could do. If you check Twitter, we haven't spammed Twitter with a million trillion uh, hashtags, but there was a number of, of spontaneous uh, things. Uh, one of the, I think, more interesting things was uh, um, an artist, uh, an artist, a student from Max, from I think it's Copenhagen. Uh, they're also the people in the photo. Um, that has been drawing these comics about the lectures. If you haven't seen them, they're on Twitter and, and you should check them up. They're, they're pretty funny. And actually the, the speakers were pretty happy themselves. They have been retweeting the, the comics about their presentation. So you probably saw them because of this. So in a sense, this, this uh, kind of worked. So the lectures, as always, very successful. I think that this ha kind of virtual format has definitely some positive strengths. We have been always recording the videos, but now we have a better integration with YouTube that allows the live sharing and these kind of things. And I think this is going to remain even next year because it's really working well. I think people um, complain about the breaks. Normally we have half an hour break. I would say when, when people are physically in Lisbon, people are more in sync. And I think it's easier to just uh, stay through the hour that, or hour and a half of uh, an entire lecture maybe maybe that's a problem with the virtual format that you feel that you require more more breaks right um but in general excellent feedback for the lectures um people would like more real uh, life examples i think that the school puts a strong emphasis in fundament and fundamentals of uh, machine learning and nlp um but we definitely can can do better there so pre-recorded lectures were not as successful and i think that that is Understandable, like people definitely prefer the live aspect of it, even if it's uh, yes, the ability to to do interactions. I think we try to do it so that even if we have something pre-recorded, the speaker is normally there. I think that one technicality that I'm sure you all realize, but there's many people around the world. They're in their houses in maybe west uh, side of the United States or east, or and it's it's hard for them to be there present, right? So we try to move things around. If you notice some weird format in the schedule, this has to do with us trying to accommodate the speaker time. So at the end, even if things were pre-recorded, um, normally the speakers were there and they were able to interact and see their, themselves presenting. The labs, they went good. Uh, general uh, positive feedback. Um, yeah, if you didn't finish the labs, don't worry. And take the labs as a series of pointers of directions to follow, right? And the amount of information in the labs is uh, is very high, particularly as, as the feedback indicates. The first two days are highly misleading in the sense that they're they're quite achievable, but then it very very quickly becomes something that's that's complicated and requires you to invest an amount of time, right? And and the physical labs are definitely maybe better. To do the interactions, I think people cluster together more easier. So if you have a problem, there's a guy, two tables from you that finished already and can jump in and help. The monitors can also do rounds and force a bit more of interactivity, right? So that's a problem of the virtual format. But in general, I would say we managed to get most of most of the labs, even even them being physical. And uh, if you were to come to Lisbon, you would realize that even though we have good con air conditioning. The weather in the labs might not be as good as, as the control weather you might have in your homes, right? We do have air conditioning, but still, the Lisbon can get pretty hot. Okay, um, yes, remote facilities in general, I think we basically use live webinars. Some people still use the, the YouTube streaming. One thing we observed last year is there's a lot of private conversations in Slack, which is great. And I think that we don't see them, so but we know they're, they're there. So. Um, it's also very positive that people still do networking in the virtual world. 
Gather Town, I think there was more positive feedback about Gather Town uh, this time around compared to last year. I think people are slowly getting used to these formats, right? Like we have been using Gather Town in every Congress and I think it's starting to catch on just in time for us to never use it again because it's over and there's no pandemic and we can just uh, have some coffee in the real Lisbon, right? Um, so let me, um, the Zoom went right. I think uh, Gather Town is not perfect, but it's, it's what we have, right? We will keep Slack. That's definitely very useful uh, and a very, very, very nice way to organize things. Um, overall, I think it's positive. We think that the, the feedback was very positive. Um, there were some remarks that we would just basically think about. The breaks, it might be something to do with the virtual format, but we would think that uh, because we haven't gotten that feedback uh, in prior years. Um, the slides, yes, I think that's definitely uh, better. It's, it, we can organize this better. And I think I'm also partly to blame for that because normally I have to put the, the slides and sometimes I've, I haven't been uh, fast enough. Transformers is definitely something that we have to advance towards. Um, and again, it, it's hard to give fundamentals, which I think is one of the strengths of the paper, of the, of the labs and of the school, and then have a lot of hands-on examples, right? It, we can also try to make um, an improvement there. In general, we really appreciate the feedback. There was a lot of feedback and that, that's always great. Um, of course, this happens, particularly in the physical XMLS because there's a number of companies that put money uh, to pay, for example, for the grants, in this case, for the licenses of the different uh, virtual tools and things like this, right? Um, so, of course, Google is a very generous sponsor that, that has been supporting us for many years, cleverly this year also helped. Um, there's many partners. Uh, you have to take into account that the organizers are here, uh, yes, basically because they want to, and they invest time, and, and we're getting old, and we all have a lot of things to do, and we just push it and manage to take time to organize the school, right? And this means that there's a lot of institutions that are donating a lot of time that is very, very valuable and, and is used for many other things just to organize the school, right? Uh, so many thanks to the many partners that have the patience uh, to allow us to do this and, and to help otherwise. The speakers that we have is by far the, the strongest resource of the school. Uh, this stems from its origins from the beginning. We always had these very, very great speakers top uh, internationally and we wouldn't be uh, the same without them, right? So it's, it's definitely some, somebody that, that some, some fundamental factor of the school. Um, the monitors, uh, you won't imagine, there's a lot of movement that you don't see behind the curtains. Uh, they're great, they come every, every year, the sort of people, new people, old people. Um, if you want to be monitored next year, please think about it. We will uh, circle out probably towards the end of the year, beginning of the year, a call, right? It's a fun thing, it's a lot of work, um, but I think that they do an amazing work. And uh, yeah, of course, like you, thanks for coming. Thanks for applying. Thanks for, for enjoying and, and making us, uh, giving us the opportunity to try to, to give you something, right? And we hope we, we have achieved this. Um, yeah, and that's it. Um, I hope you have enjoyed the school. Um, virtual format has these weird things that when things finish, you don't know exactly when they finish. So let's just declare them finished and uh, have fun. Go trip back to your coach or something. Bye. Bye bye. We're going to bye. See you. Bye bye, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. It was a pleasure.